I know. Look who finally decided to show up. I know I've been gone for multiple... It's fine. Don't worry about it. I've been very busy. Ever since I posted my first Total Drama video, the Izzy isn't crazy conspiracy, people have wanted more. The original plan I had by myself was to release that in July 2022 and then do the next video exactly a year later, July 2023. I knew that the whole time. The entire time you were asking for more, I knew I was going to do it in July 2023. So apologies to all the people who are asking me and demanding that I make more. It was never up to you. It's technically my fault for asking, ooh, who should I talk about next to millions of people I'm being told. But in my defense, I never in a million years thought that many people would watch that video. At the time, I wouldn't think 3,000 people would see the video, much less 3 million. I knew I wanted to talk about Total Drama again but I didn't know to what degree. Should I talk about the new reboot series that basically shadow dropped in the middle of me writing this? Should I talk about the host? Should I go retrospective and talk about me watching the show as a kid and what it meant to me in my development? How the show impacted me and how the show impacted the internet? Because everyone knows Gwen. Ooh, hot goth girl, step on me. But do they really know her? They know what she looks like. And in that video, I asked who people would want to see me talk about the most. And it was a tough decision. The main front runners were Ezekiel, Courtney, Lindsay, and Heather. And that again was a tough decision. Heather is my favorite character. The show has been incredibly unfair to Lindsay and Courtney has the most visible corruption arc and her taste in men says a lot about her as a character. And Ezekiel is weird. But then I racked my brain. Maybe I could talk about all four of them. What do these four have in common? All their lives were ruined by the show total drama. And I don't mean, oh man, they got famous, they can't be normal teenagers anymore. I mean legitimate psychological damage, just like me with the previous video. And then I looked a little deeper and realized no character comes out of the show unscathed, except for Eva. Eva, Eva turns out all right. So she's going in the corner. So this video is not an analysis of just one character. It's an analysis of the game itself, of the show. This is... I'm gonna be going in depth about how every character comes out the other side of this game worse off. And that doesn't mean they were purposefully ruined by the producers or hosts or game itself. It just means their lives would have been legitimately better off had they never auditioned for Total Drama. The easiest thing I could have done for this video is go in elimination order. And trust me, I do still have it memorized up here. But there's differing degrees of ruined here. We have subcategories under subcategories here. But to start us off, I'd separated them into three categories. Physical damage, mental damage, and both. Some characters physically recover more than others. Others do not. Whether or not certain things could be described as damage is questionable, but it's the widest net I could cast at the time. This is also the perfect way for me to talk about multiple characters while also bringing up mini theories I picked up while watching the show again, like I do every year, that wouldn't warrant their own video. For example, I think Trent has brain damage. Poor Trent here has one of the worst and hardest to watch character derailments in the series, but also I do terrible with secondhand embarrassment, so that might be it. Basically in the first season, Trent is just a normal guy. His entire character is that he's the normal guy on the team. And due to this and his guitar, I guess he manages to get Gwen to fall for him and they eventually start going out. But by season two, he's become a completely different person. He became extremely paranoid and very OCD, which you could argue is an extension of paranoia. He does everything nine times because he believes it's the only thing keeping everything from falling apart. Paranoia. And this isn't another classic example of BH Ultra being wrong about mental health. I'm not saying all OCD people are paranoid. I'm just saying there's a lot more examples of Trent being paranoid that point him in that direction than just normal OCD. Some of the characters believe that the lucky number nine is derived from there being five letters in Trent and four in Gwen. Putting them together creates nine. But it's okay because later in the Aftermath show, Trent explains this away by telling a sad story about a toy train. Doesn't explain away the branding, though. Which grip wants to take the heat? Got anything in a G? That's really weird, man. And the train doesn't even explain it all away, because when we see him next again in the finale, he is still equally as paranoid and obsessed. Something that he wasn't in season one. I've heard theories that he just has OCD and he decided to not take his meds for the second season, which wouldn't explain his constant need for validation from Gwen and his appearance on the Aftermath show. Why was he off his meds on the Aftermath show? You can go home from the Aftermath show. You can't go home from Total Drama. 
unless you're eliminated. And you can only come back if you're Izzy, really, multiple times. The purpose of this video, like the previous video, is to not only make theories about characters, but to, in doing so, explain plot contrivances and character derailments. Trent becomes a completely different person in season two onwards, so we have to look in season one and what's different and what changes and what happens. What happens is he gets a crate full of pounds of oranges thrown at his head and it's later confirmed that he got a concussion. He gets food poisoning and regular poisoning after eating the bad parts of a poisonous blowfish. And he falls thousands of feet from an airplane and splats on the ground. That's enough to kill a man. It's an eight story. What are you eight talking story. about? It's, exactly. That's death height. That's a death, dude. The logic of pain in the Total Drama universe seems to work on a spectrum when in reality it has more to do with who's taking the punishment. Throughout the series, characters like Noah, Cody, Harold, Tyler, and Brick take far more damage. Even Duncan gets beat up more than you would think, but we'll get to him. But these characters are resilient. These nerds and dweebs know how to take a beating and keep trucking on. They're resilient. Trent is not used to this. We'll come back to those characters in a second, but first I want to finish my Trent theory. Permanent brain damage doesn't make you cartoonishly dumb, but it can make you more paranoid. The commonest types seen following brain injury are paranoid and persecutory delusional beliefs. But Trent doesn't just become stupid or weird. He does roll a big rock around. That's like what a caveman thinks is romantic. Like that entire final episode, he's constantly distracting Gwen and accidentally costing her challenges. If we wanted to argue that he got dumber, we easily could. But he still keeps his wits. He just becomes incredibly paranoid. Heather ends up kissing Trent because he convinces her that Gwen is bullying and being mean to her and that he should feel bad for Heather. And he does. He falls for it and he feels bad for her, even though he's been front and center to every terrible deed Heather's done prior to this moment, except for the cooking challenge, because he was in the infirmary with a concussion. He even called her out directly to her face when she read Gwen's diary. He knows better than to trust Heather or he knew better. But a constantly paranoid man would easily be convinced that his girlfriend was secretly talking behind his back at all times. And then we get to total drama action where Trent is constantly concerned and paranoid that Duncan is going to steal his girl, almost confirming and sealing his fate that Duncan will steal his girl. He demands constant attention and affirmation from Gwen, which he didn't need before. He reverts to a baby, constantly needing that validation, begging mommy to pay attention to him. Every little thing seems world ending to him, which is where the number nine comes in, but that's not OCD, that's a superstition. Because what is OCD if not thinking you need to do something very specific or else everything's going to go wrong? That might not be true. I actually don't know a whole lot about the subject despite Maybe having- oh, I'm moving on. But if it's paranoia and not OCD, paranoia is a symptom of brain damage. He continues to aggravate this injury throughout action and then throws the game, eventually getting himself booted off. Things got a little nuts. Okay, I got nuts. Liking Gwen made me crazy. Crazy enough to lose a million bucks. Guess the grips are better off without me. Ugh. I think my forehead needs a bit of time to heal. He seems okay on the next Aftermath show, but by the time we see him in the finale, he still seems paranoid and... I don't like to use the word crazy. And then worst of all, after all of this, he joined a hokey boy band. I'm not saying he was super talented before this, but he wouldn't have done this. He definitely like becomes a worse musician thanks to his brain injury. It's possible to forget how to play an instrument due to brain trauma, which is really a shame because... His guitar was really his only defining characteristic. Oh wow, a white dude with a guitar. It's a very rare breed. Trent is forever changed by the game Total Drama, and no amount of lawsuits is going to make that okay. And there will be lawsuits, because... I'm warning you, my dad's a lawyer! If it's a mental issue due to physical damage, I feel like it would still go under mental. Because he's not concussed anymore, but the brain da- I'm- I'm going with mental, I think. It could be both, but I think I'm going with mental. All these nerd and dork characters I mentioned prior come out relatively unscathed, except for Cody. It's kind of unclear whether or not he actually likes Sierra, but regardless, the show exposed him to a very dangerous stalker. A stalker who previously only watched him through her TV, but now knows where he is at all times. I'll count that as ruin, that's psychological damage. At the very least, it's distress. This show has a habit of punishing characters in way harsher ways than anything they've ever done. The bit is that Cody gets his own annoying crush after being annoying and creepy and persistent towards Gwen, but it wasn't this bad. 
right? He did also get put in a full body cast and then almost drowned because of it, but don't worry, he bounced back. I'm sticking to the rules of this universe, and one of those rules is if we see a character who's been beat up and put in a full body cast or some kind of deformation, but then we see them later and they're okay, then that means they're okay. But if the last time we see them is them getting injured or disfigured, we have to assume that's how they continued because that's where they left off. This is the perfect transition into everyone's favorite character. Blainly. The last time we see Blainly, she is in a full body cast and is propped and strapped up to one of those push-pull things that's at the back of every store. But we've seen Total Drama contestants come back from far worse injury, but that's the thing. She's not really a Total Drama contestant. Like, she was on the show, but she isn't seasoned in the game. I also think she's older than the teens. Even if she's like late 20s, which is being generous, let's be honest, she's still more susceptible to getting injured. I thought I was invincible as a teenager, but now everything hurts all the time and I'm constantly worried that my feet tingling mean I'm gonna lose them or I'm going to die. Anyway, even if she isn't permanently injured, she still suffered constant embarrassment on both Total Drama and the Aftermath show, live TV. Total Drama is an embarrassing show, but we forget that for a while in canon, it is the most popular show in their world. Like in Celebrity Manhunt, they're all on the red carpet and the joke is that, oh, they're all washed up, they didn't win any awards. But do reality shows ever win awards? After the Celebrity Manhunt, we can still assume that people are still watching the show. Imagine farting a bunch and having your crooked gross <laughs> teeth shown to everyone on national television in front of millions of people. And that brings us back to the dorks and nerds. Harold is the the only outlier here because he's basically immune to embarrassment. Like his undies have been shown multiple times on the show and he keeps trucking on. Yeah, he gets bullied a lot during the show's run, but it's kind of hard to tell if that would have happened whether or not he was on the show. Harold is actually one of the few characters that comes out the other side of the show a better person. He gets a hot girlfriend who loves him. He comes out of his shell more because of the show. He gets decently far one of the times. All because of the show. Good job, Doris. Oh. Oh, Doris. Get on with it, Doris. <laughs> Again, it's questionable whether or not this actually affects Harold, but this little guy could have gone his whole life without his middle name being outed. Maybe it would have been on official government documents, but nobody really sees those. Having your real embarrassing name that you don't want people to know outed on national television is probably a huge blow to your self-esteem and just general morale, but again, we don't know if this affects Harold. Harold is immune to embarrassment, but again, having a name that you want to keep secret on national television is a huge embarrassment. However, I'm going to put Harold down here with Eva because he's relatively unaffected, but that perfectly transitions us into Beverly. Whose first name is really Beverly? That's not an embarrassing question. Who cares if a girl's real name is Beverly? <laughs> Correct. Beverly. At least Harold had other attributes and funny lines that helped him stand out more than his silly name. Beverly did a good job in the game, but because of his not speaking, that's all he's ever going to be known as. Maybe he could have gotten over his nonverbal tendencies as he stayed longer on the show, or maybe just found a way to communicate with the people he grew closer with, but no. He got booted off very early. Really all that happened is that he got eliminated very early, and then all the contestants laughed at his name. And then we never see him again. <laughs> It was not easy getting B up here, because there's a lot of characters who only show up for a couple episodes and don't stick around long enough to do anything. Leonard is going down here with Harold and Eva because he is unstoppable. This is also a terrible way to start this off. There's almost more people unaffected than there are affected. This is not going well. I mean, you could argue that Total Drama enabled his delusion that we see he keeps later on in the Redonkulous race. However, I'm gonna be honest, I don't care that much about Leonard. A character like Tyler suffers serious injury after serious injury, but always manages to bounce back. And back to the rule of thumb, again, if you see a character after they've been gravely injured and they're okay, then they're okay. But if we don't see them, bad news. We have to assume that it sticks. The last time we see Tyler, he's knocked out cold and then runs away from lava, but he survived worse. So the question here wouldn't be, is he worse off? The question is, did the show ruin him? The term all pain and no gain comes to mind in relation to Tyler. He joins the show and immediately wipes out. That's the first thing we see of him. But people tend to forget that he's a legitimately talented athlete. He constantly lists off his accomplishments and he manages to pull most of his team by himself in the Yukon. 
most of his team. But because of his constant injuries and embarrassments, nobody will ever take him seriously again. Because honestly, what are his aspirations aside from being good at sports? He's not smart. The only things Tyler could have possibly hoped for were to become a legitimate star athlete on a legitimate sports team or become a celebrity, neither of which are viable now. I mean, the only reason he's in world tour in general is because he went on a ton of reality shows and pulled a bunch of publicity stunts that no one really cared about. They're never gonna put him on a real team. They all know what he's afraid of. In the Phobia Factor Challenge, he is one of the few that did not overcome their fears. He lost to a chicken and then got voted off. The Total Drama Machine chewed up Tyler and then spit him out when they were done in more ways than one. Also, after each episode of World Tour, there was a bonus clip featuring the eliminated character and where they landed throughout the world. Some characters land where they just were and others land in completely different places because they were already mid-flight when they fell out of the plane. Sorry, pushed out of the plane. Sorry, occasionally jumped out of the plane. Tyler is one of the characters that gets thrown out after the plane has already taken off, but he's still attacked by aliens. Now... He could still be close to Area 51, and that's why they attacked him. Or, the aliens view him as a threat to their species and will now terrorize him for the rest of his life. Uh-oh. You could argue that he sustained lasting physical damage, but I think that the mental is worse. I'm sensing a pattern here. Which leads us to our next loser, Brick but he's a little bit more complicated. Because like Tyler, he gets injured over and over, but surprisingly, he ends up okay in the end. But in comparison to Tyler, nobody will ever take him seriously again. His most defining action in Revenge of the Island was pissing his pants. Yeah, he's a good guy and a loyal friend, but your army mates aren't gonna care about that. That being said, Brick is actually one of the few characters given a happy ending. I'm gonna spend it all on you guys instead. Hello, world's biggest television in every game system in existence. I can finally open my dream gym. Fashion school, here I come. Yeah, you heard me. That's actually really nice. Surprisingly nice for this show. He can finally follow his heart and his dreams, and now he has the money to do it. Sometimes. Now, we're not going to get into multiple timelines. Uh, yet, we'll save that for later. The Total Drama Multiverse is expanding. Brick gets the money and decides to go to beauty school because Cameron wins the money and decides to split it with everyone. Also, real quick, Cameron does make lasting friends on Total Drama, but he decides to give the money away because he realizes that the money that would have gone to making a new bubble for him, he doesn't need anymore. He's grown out of the bubble. He doesn't need it. And then the next time we see him, he was injured so bad that he was forced back into his bubble. Sorry, Cam. For those of you who don't know, every season of Total Drama had two finalists and two alternate endings for each of them winning, and which region got which answer would depend on who was most popular there. The finale for Revenge of the Island is Cameron versus Lightning, and in Lightning's ending, he doesn't share the money at all. Brick doesn't get the money, and he doesn't get to go to beauty school. It's also worth noting that Lightning's dad put all of his Hall of Fame rings on the line for Lightning to win. So in Cameron's ending, Lightning will go in mental because his dad will always resent him and he'll never live up to the expectations. Sad. Both of the endings are sad, but I have something more definite for Lightning later. I like Cameron's ending more. It makes more sense as an ending, but that's not really up to me. In the last video, we figured out that the canonical winners are Owen, maybe Beth, and then probably Heather. When Heather appears in Revenge of the Island, she says she was screwed out of the money last time, which could mean that she lost, but it could also mean that she won and she was owed the money, but then a gremlin man took the money from the host and fell in an active volcano. Happens on all these shows. We gotta get like insurance for this or something. Oh wait, Andrew, are we gonna talk about that? What do you think? But Revenge of the Island doesn't have a canon winner. It's either Cameron or Lightning. So in one ending, Brick gets to live his dream and leave all the people who were so mean to him behind. And in another ending, he peed his pants and goes back to the army where they're probably gonna bully him. I'm gonna put him in the psychological category, but I'm gonna tilt the picture because multiple timelines are at play. But isn't that also torture in and of itself, being constantly trapped between two cosmic realities that are both equally true and untrue? I would go crazy. Noah gets injured a lot in the series, mostly in World Tour and mostly by Owen, but it's nothing compared to the embarrassment he suffered. These nerds will not stop. One of the rewards listed by Chris in the very first episode is cheesy tabloid fame. Only one will be left standing and will be rewarded with cheesy tabloid fame and 
a small fortune, which let's face it, they'll probably blow in a week. And the theme song is literally, I want to be famous. So every single person that competes becomes a minor celebrity, at least for a good while. And that shit ruins your brain. Noah had potential aspirations. He was a smart kid. He could have been anything, but ever since getting that little brush of fame, he becomes a douchebag's assistant. And the last time we see him, he's still running the reality show circuit. But at least he's not one of those sad people who has to do them. That was supposed to be a perfect transition into talking about Owen, and we will talk about Owen in a sec. But I think getting exposed to the minor celebrity world and then getting corrupted and sucked in and stuck in said world is the perfect transition into Gwen. Gwen started out as a quiet kid who kind of bled into the background, but then she had her dirty laundry aired on national television, literally and figuratively. Imagine being a relatively normal girl and you're used to getting by unnoticed and then in the span of a year, you have your diary read on national television, you get buried alive while you have claustrophobia, they show your ass and panties on national television, you're 16 by the way. Your struggles with your ex-boyfriend is an important plot point in this incredibly popular television show and then you're placed in a love triangle which paints you as the bad guy. Imagine back to when you were a teenager. Imagine if your entire messy love life was on the front page of TMZ. Also, you're constantly asked invasive questions about your identity. But it doesn't come close to what Gwen did, if that's even your real name. What do you mean by that? <laughs> and you're left with no friends. One of the few guys who was actually very nice to you on the show becomes a ratings crazed douchebag right in front of your eyes, and he never apologizes, by the way. Your ex-boyfriend gets brain damage, and then your next boyfriend cares more about his ex than you on national TV. It's international, Jeff. Total drama is seen all over the world. Oh. But then you finally become friends with the girl whose heart you broke, but then you find a list that you're crossed out on showing that she never actually cared about you. And you could easily prove that this causes psychological damage. When we first saw her, she would lay insults on everyone that crossed her path. She would speak her mind. But then by the final season we see her, she's been painted as the evil villain by so many people that she goes out of her way to make everyone like her. She becomes Little Miss Sunshine. She bends over backwards to be nicer than she's ever been to everyone, but none of that matters because that's never who she's been. Nothing too foo-foo girly. I almost got my hair wet. <gasps> I would never let that happen. Your hair is fantastic. No, your hair is. What's your secret? I double condition. Also, I don't know the long-term effects of getting shot by an EpiPen when you're not allergic, but it can't be good. Also, this isn't important to my analysis, but she is allergic, like violently to eucalyptus. How does she not know how an EpiPen works? That's not what we're here to talk about. Woohoo! Yeah! Aside from the constant embarrassment and partial nudity, the game and fame has warped her brain. My rhymes suck, dude. In the double length special that takes place between Total Drama Action and Total Drama World Tour called The Celebrity Manhunt, we see what all the teens have been up to between seasons, which we didn't get in the previous in-between because action takes place mere days after Island. Between seasons, all these kids that have a bunch of newfound fame either try and turn that fame into a long-term business or positive change, or keep scratching and clawing to get more famous, or to keep that same amount of famous. I wanna be famous. You know that thing about um, celebrities often fall into pitfalls dug for them? Something is forced upon you so often that you just start to accept it because you don't know any different. Gwen was an introverted teen who had- Ow. Gwen was an introverted teen who, like we said, had her dirty laundry constantly aired on this TV show, national television, popular show, constantly with the drama. And then as soon as she's finally out of the clutches of the show, she makes drama videos on her YouTube channel. She gets into a cyber war with Heather, which is not something episode one Gwen would do. She's stuck in a vicious cycle of drama and tabloids that she may never escape from. Even if she tried to go and live a normal life again, they probably wouldn't leave her alone. And again, when someone begins to call you something over and over again, you start to believe it. And then you start to double down. Also, um, well, the electric shocks have stopped, but I still feel so weak. And when I close my eyes, all I see are eels, eels, and more eels. But I'm sure it's only temporary, nothing to go home over. Good night's sleep in a real bed is all I need. <laughs>
If that clip looks really bad quality, it's because it's the highest quality one I could find. Now, we don't know if Gwen still has ill-related PTSD to this day, but it wouldn't be the worst thing that's happened to her. Right into psychological torment you go. I was gonna put her next to Cody, but that seems cruel. Oh, not Trent either. Uh, hang out with Brick. Brick isn't being sideways anymore. He's trying to break out of his timeline. They could do makeup together. It'd be cute. This is a very uneven board. Speaking of becoming what people expect of you, Lindsay. Lindsay goes through a whole lot of development in Total Drama Action and even Island a little bit. Lindsay is constantly held back and belittled by her alliance mate Heather and never gets to live up to her full potential. One of the first things she says after arriving on the island is, I thought this was a talent contest. She went there to showcase her talent. And then when they have a legitimate talent contest on the show, she doesn't even compete because Heather makes the rules. And we never find out what her talent is, but that doesn't mean she doesn't have any. We see her evolve and start to live up to that potential when she finally stands up to Heather in the biking challenge, which she got royally screwed out of. And then in Total Drama Action, she's put on a team where no one bosses her around and she takes advantage, she finally takes charge. And it goes well for a while. The only reason her team turns on Admiral Lindsay, her hotness, is not because she's dumb or has bad ideas. It's because she's bossy. And when Courtney joins the show, she now has to battle with her. Courtney takes charge because that's what Courtney does, and she belittles Lindsay's intelligence and leadership ability the entire time. Until eventually what seemed to be a more intelligent and capable Lindsay accidentally votes herself off. <laughs> yeah. Lindsay, time for you to say sayonara. That means goodbye. Now, initially, I didn't like this. I thought it was a really unfulfilling and anticlimactic way to get her off the show. So I wanted to build a theory around her similar to the Izzy theory. Like, that could not have happened. Surely she had some kind of ulterior motive or secret plan. But the thing about life is sometimes you just get unlucky. I'm sorry, Leonard. Oh, no. All right, well, Leonard has now sustained physical damage. Real quick, I just want to say while doing this, I absolutely despise the Chris and the producers helped Heather get farther in the game because she's good for ratings and drama because it completely negates how hard she competes and incredible insight into her character to explain away one lucky win, sometimes you get lucky, sometimes you get unlucky. It just happens. Like you could explain any of Heather's other wins away perfectly and it would still make sense why she won or didn't get voted off. The game was not rigged in her favor because she got lucky once in the pirate treasure episode, okay? How did he find that book on the toilet? Was it set up there by someone? No. Just bad luck. Lindsay suffers another incredibly embarrassing moment on national television and everyone laughs at her. And this is just episodes after everyone laughed at her big feet. And maybe, just maybe, she can come back from this, but almost immediately after, she goes to a French jail for who knows how long. By now, she's given up. This isn't to say that she got intelligence and then just became dumb again. She was always dumb but she still had confidence. A confident woman has been embarrassed and made so many mistakes that she doesn't even trust her own judgment and doesn't want to make her own choices anymore, so she decides it would be easier to just let someone else decide for her. Like in season one, when she let Heather make all her decisions, she's regressing. So in world tour, she frantically looks for Tyler, she lets Alejandro tell her what to do, and she looks to DJ for support. I know the bit with Team Victory is that they keep losing, but none of that is really Lindsay's fault. Of all the Team Victory members, she competes the best. She She's the only one that isn't eliminated due to Alejandro plotting. She's just bad at fashion. She's brought back on Revenge of the Island and then is left on an island by herself with mutant beavers. That must have been her breaking point. We don't know why all of the All-Stars cast are back in the game, but we do hear from some of them, and most of the ones we hear have nothing to do with the money or the game. Gwen only came back to get closer to Courtney, and Sam only came back to get closer to Toxic Waste. We'll get to that. Maybe the contestants were asked back and they got to choose, or maybe it's in their contracts that they can be brought back for an infinite amount of seasons. We don't know why Lindsay is there, but when we see her in All Stars, she is cartoonishly dumb. Uh, just push! Okay, how do you push again? Like, she wasn't smart, but she was never that dumb. So what happened? Did she get dumber while stuck on Boney Island? No. In the first episode of All Stars, she says a lot of dumb things and trusts a lot of people she knows she shouldn't, 
but she says stuff to very specific people. Here is the list of dumb things Lindsay does in the first and her only episode of Total Drama All-Stars. She eggs Heather on about missing her lover that she hates so much. She slows Courtney down by not knowing how to push. She notices Courtney before Sierra jumps on and buries her, but doesn't say anything. She calls Alejandro Jalapeno, which his is the only name she never got wrong before. And then she votes herself off. Some people seem to think that she accidentally votes herself off in All-Stars like she did in a season prior, but she is relieved and excited when it's her who's going home. Maybe Maybe she just wanted out of the game, and if people already expect her to be dumb, why not act the part? But all the dumb things she does in that episode specifically hurts or annoys Courtney, Alejandro, and Heather, the three people who thought she was the dumbest. She knows how to push, and she saw Courtney under Sierra. Courtney was just awful to her, as was Heather and Alejandro, who she embarrasses in this episode. If you're just watching this and you actually haven't seen the show and you're wondering, well, like, oh, she called Alejandro a different name, who cares? He does. A lot. No way, Jose! What? What did you just say? Never call me that again! Al hates being called Al? Gosh, Al! Owen must have called Al, Al, like a thousand times! Huh, Al? <laughs> Poor Al! Shut it! Lindsay acts perfectly normal and nice around everyone else in the show, but she acts the dumbest and screws over the people who expected the least from her. If they think of her as stupid, might as well show them how stupid she really can be. All in all, Lindsay does get the last laugh, but she will never trust her own judgment for the rest of her life. She'll want someone else to control her. She'll probably marry some real dick. Psychological damage. I feel like the board is very lopsided, but that's because because 90% of the injuries are psychological, and every time they are physical, we tend to see the characters okay afterwards. So I say we mix it up a little and talk about physical deformities. Justin. Yes, I'm serious. There is an early episode of Total Drama Island where Jeff gets an itty bitty little splinter that the cameras can barely see. But he sells it like his leg is broken and he's gonna die. It doesn't make a whole lot of sense and I know it's just a joke, but we're looking at the lore of this serialized show. So we have to believe that everything we see on these cameras that isn't a dream sequence is factual. It doesn't matter that it's played for a joke. It happened. Similarly, in season two, Justin gets a little scratch on his face that we can't even see and then instantly loses his ability to swoon anyone. Yes, it's a joke about how vain Justin is and how much he cares about his appearance that he's freaking out over a little scratch. Regardless of if it's a joke or not, Justin enters total drama action, being able to control anyone he wants, using Beth and Lindsay as a control group, and then leaves total drama action, not being able to control anyone using Beth and Lindsay as a control group. Even if Justin looks the exact same to us, in canon, he is so deformed that his magical pretty boy powers don't work anymore. The only people we see who are attracted to him after this are attracted to the whole boy band he's in. Katie, Blainley, and Sadie still think Justin is cute, but they react the same way about Trent, who only had the ability to swoon Gwen prior. It's also worth noting that Justin becomes more manipulative and dangerous as the series goes on. It's unclear whether or not he was always like this and just didn't get a chance to showcase it until the second season, or if the show made him more cutthroat. Either way, physical deformities trump all. Sorry, ugly ogre man, no one will ever love you. Speaking of which, I actually don't have a whole lot to say about Katie and Sadie. They start out as friends, and then the last time we see them, they're still friends. So I think I'm gonna put them both down with Eva. Sometimes not appearing as much has its benefits. The unaffected area is currently bigger than the physical damage area, but there is another set of characters who do end off the series worse off. You'll notice that I've mostly talked about original cast members, and that's not because of favoritism, it's just because we've seen a lot more of them so they're easier to categorize. I really had to stretch for Beverly. Total Drama has a constant issue of when and where to wrap up character arcs. The whole reason behind the scenes, not canon, that Trent went off the rails is because they gave him kind of a happy ending in season one and didn't know where to go from there. So ever since that happened, they have purposefully left stories open just in case they got another season. And it worked out for Revenge of the Island because we did end up seeing some of these characters again. But for characters from, say, Pacatail Island, that's the last time we ever saw them. And yes, it's pronounced pack a tail. They say it in the show. So you could argue that Katie and Sadie had a huge fight and there's no way they could ever come back from that. But we see them again and they are fine. 
you know who we don't see again, Sammy and Amy. So for those of you who haven't seen Total Drama Pack of Tail Island, I don't blame you. I've rewatched every season, every year since they've come out, and I've only seen Pack of Tail twice. One of those two times was for this video, and the other time was when it came out. And one of like the three or four plots in this series, you can only do so much with 13 episodes. Amy fancies herself the older twin and bosses Sammy around and criticizes her for copying everything she does. In reality, Sammy is just super timid and wants to stand out on her own. Why she decided to keep wearing the same outfit? Who knows? In this universe, no one really changes their outfit, except for the one time Lindsay did an island. But for the first time, Sammy cuts the cord and gets rid of Amy and gets to be her own person for the first time in her life. She gets to be her own woman for like a couple days until Amy fights her way back on the island and immediately outs her. And then they're both shot out of a cannon and we never see them again. Now, Sammy feeling smothered and overshadowed by Amy was not new to this show. It happened way before they came on Total Drama, but Sammy kept it to herself until she publicly stood up to her and screwed them both out of a million dollars. I believe that this problem is only going to get worse. Amy will seek revenge and become more mean and bitter. Sammy is capable of standing up for herself, but only when she has a strong support system around her, which she won't get at home because we know that their parents prefer Amy and she doesn't have any friends back home. Sammy will get tortured the rest of her high school career because of her actions on the show, which explains why Sammy goes up here because her life has been made notably worse by the show. But aside from Amy, Amy getting screwed out of a million dollars and publicly told off by her sister. I'm gonna drop the Amy bit now. Her name's Amy. She holds all the power. Why would she be up here? But again, if we're going off the rule of if we don't see them again, we can assume something terrible has happened. Amy gets shot out of a cannon and then completely on her own within the elements on a fake artificial island that's constantly changing to hurt the teens, she fights her way back. And we see her covered in mud and sticks with scratches all over her. The island is dangerous during the game and the contestants aren't being fed, but at least there's like producers and cameramen around. The teens can get seriously injured and maimed while on the show, but they're not gonna let them die. But once they're shot out of a cannon, they're free game. Because of that same reason, I'm gonna put Beardo up here because I have a head cannon that because he was the first person shot out of a cannon, he did not survive. Or at least I hope so. I'm not a huge fan of Beardo. Like the characters get gimmicky later and he's the worst. Like at least we see Leonard later. He's perfectly fine. Nothing can stop this man. I see it falling. So he's dead. I'm gonna say he's dead. Like at the end of that season, we see them fly away in a plane. And if Amy was still on the island after getting shot out, we can assume everyone else was too. With some exceptions. This video, does require a lot of head cannoning, but I am trying to convince you guys with as much irrefutable evidence as possible. But this thing, just wishful thinking. If this video gets as popular as the last one and you're a fan of Total Drama, anytime someone asks you about the show, say, oh, I love Total Drama. It's a shame Beardo died though. Say that exactly. Put those exact words in the comments if you made it this far. The video just started. Anyway, Amy was left to her own devices to fight for her life on an island designed to kill. And that's gonna mess with your psyche. And building off the back of fighting for your life ruining your psyche, Zoe. Zoe was an only child and a lonely kid. Her small town didn't contain a lot of people she got along with until she got on the show and made friends with the likes of Brick, Cameron, and Mike. And it's really nice and sweet. She started out as a shy girl, but came out of her shell more. She started to forge more meaningful relationships with human people until she got so physically and mentally abused that she became an extreme hunter woman. And we see later in All-Stars that she still has some of that left inside. And while being able to do this is cool and all, but it isn't really useful anywhere outside of the game. Maybe she could do more reality competitions, but is that really what she wants to do? It's not gonna get you far in the real world. In the All-Stars finale, there's about a 50-50 shot that she wins the million dollars. A million dollars is a whole lot of money, a life-changing amount of money, but she is a teenager. She'll likely blow it. Every winner had eventually lost their money and come back to the game for more, except for Beth. She just gave up. If she had trouble making friends before, being an elf character from Lord of the Rings and shooting arrows while swinging from trees isn't gonna help. And even if we believe she will be fine and come out of the game unscathed, she still went through enough trauma, total trauma, to make her snap in the first place. That stuff doesn't just go away. She suffers her first betrayal, heartbreak, and head trauma all in the same show. And all this because Chef broke the mic necklace Mike gave her. 
Why does Mike have a Mike necklace? Like, why would you own a medallion of your own face on it? That dude's weirder than I thought. Everyone goes on total drama to win money, so listing didn't get the million dollars as psychological trauma is way too easy. But some people ended up more disappointed than others because they had extra contingencies. I want to be on total drama because... Yeah, I want to meet other teens outside my small town that go to indie theater and wear retro clothes and horn room glasses. <laughs> Every Saturday night, the town jocks drive up and down Main Street cheering for the football team. Seriously, if I get on the show, my worst nightmare would be to get voted off by a jock. And that's the only hanging chad. If Zoe can't win, the least she can do to preserve her own self-worth is not get voted off by a jock. And then she gets eliminated by lightning. At least she made a lot of friends using her nice attitude, except for Dawn. Zoe's all like, oh, Dawn is so weird. She thinks she can read people's minds. And then we see her using tarot cards later. Like lady, pick a lane. Oh yeah, Dawn's the one that believes the ridiculous superstitions. That's gonna make people mad. I'm not sorry. Would we count Zoe as physical trauma? I mean, it's mental trauma based on fit. I'll put it in both. While we're on this topic, we might as well cover Dawn. Like Zoe and like everyone, of course she wants to win. That's why everyone's there. It's by channeling their harmony that I will win total drama and donate my money to help Mother Earth. But her extra contingency is that she wants to save all the mutated creatures left on Camp Wawanakwa. And then the government gets involved. They say they're gonna quarantine it and do the right thing, but like any major celebrity or company, the producers wave their massive amount of money around and get Chris out of jail, and the next time we see the island, it's 100% toxic waste free. I don't need to do this for every word. And by rich guy speak, that means... Uh, they wiped out all the animals. They're all dead. But what the universe does want me to do is sell these discarded TDR keepsakes on Craigslist so I can start a sanctuary for all the poor mutant creatures on this island. That's adorable. Pointless, but adorable. Dawn is gonna fight her entire life to take down the total drama machine in an ultimately fruitless battle. Psychological. Also, while we're talking about animals suffering terrible radiation damage, the last time we see Anne Maria in the entirety of Total Drama is in the Toxic Waste Mine episode. Chris explains that if the teen's radiation detectors show red, then they're close to dying, and if they show skull and crossbones, they're already dead. All the teens enter the mine at the exact same time, and we have to believe that they have the same resistance to toxic waste, which is not at all. So while we only see Mike, Zoe, and Cameron's bands go red, we can assume all the characters had that. Because they entered at the exact same time. But hey, none of them got the skull and crossbones. All they got was the amount of radiation a body can take right before it dies. Oh, and then Anne Maria is launched away holding a gem she got from the radiation mine. She took it with her. If that came from the mine, then it's also super radioactive and she's been holding onto it for hours. She grabs it in daylight and then we see her still holding it at night. Now, I'm not here to imply that Anne Maria got cancer but we never see her again. So she's going in the physical category. I never really watched Total Drama Rama whatever. <gasps> How did she know? She tried to warn us. Circling back to Zoe and the idea of winning the money actually being more of a detriment than it's not. Sorry for teasing you guys with Owen before. I know I talked about like 10 people in between me saying, oh, I'm about to talk about Owen. I'm talking about him now. I have a lot to say about the original cast, but I didn't want to seem like I was playing favorites. I needed to find a way to kill Beardo. Owen is a complicated character. And by that, I mean in the total drama, 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 drama island special, he <laughs> says he's the young of three brothers, and then the Aftermath show, he talks about his two younger brothers. This is clearly just a mistake, but if we're believing all of this is canon, we need to take it at face value. So either he lied in the electric chair, which can't be true because you can't do that, you would be shocked, or the producers got the wrong information about Owen, which is possible because they also thought the Olympics started in Rome. But I'm gonna go with a third option, which says that both are true, and he has two older brothers and two little brothers, making him a middle child, and when they said he's the youngest of three, that's technically true, he's the youngest of his two older brothers, but nobody says that. None of that really matters, but I like the idea of Owen being a middle child because I'm a middle child, and it's all over his character. It explains his constant need for attention, why he blurts stuff out out in conversations, even if it won't be helpful, and why he acted out in school and pulled wild pranks. Ever since I was little, I've always felt like no one really listens to what I have to say. I'm a person who feels things deeply. Ellen, no offense, but I really don't care. Middle child syndrome eventually led to these video essays, so watch out, people with an older and younger sibling. You too could do this and regret it 
forever. With Gwen being buried alive and Zoe becoming a warrior, they're shown as okay after, but that doesn't mean they're mentally okay. It doesn't mean they didn't go through something traumatic. Similarly, Owen befriends an inanimate coconut and then has a breakdown when it's thrown off the island. I only watched the total drama seasons for this total drama video of total drama, so I didn't watch the redonkulous race, but I know Owen is in it, where he is shown to no longer have a fear of flying which is interesting. It's interesting because in World Tour, he gets over his fear because Alejandro hypnotizes him. And if that hypnosis stuck, we have to assume the other ones did too. Three, two, one, and revenge. Take me out to the ball game. Take me out with the crowd. And you may think, oh, okay, well, Alejandro can trigger that at any moment. It's not just Alejandro. The same thing happens when Courtney says revenge later in the episode. And again, if getting over his fear of flying stuck in his brain, then so does this. Whenever anyone in earshot of him says the word revenge, which is a pretty common word, he has to do the embarrassing dance against his will. That's enough to put him in psychological already, but there's so much to this character. In Revenge of the Island, see, I just said revenge. We see past contestants helping out with challenges and none of them look or sound like they wanna be there. Except for Izzy, who we theorized before is working her way up to host level, which she doesn't get, but she does get to be a movie star for like a year. So I think I'm gonna put her down here with the unscathed because she scares me. And also I legally can't talk about this character anymore. That many hours is enough. Aside from her, the only person who really wants to be back on the show is Owen. He swims from the boat across the ocean to the island just to get back on the show. That is so unlike Owen. Until you remember that Owen's family burnt through all his winnings on a cheese cellar and are now broke. And in that episode, it's a subversion. Like you think Owen's gonna be really upset, but the joke is that he's actually ecstatic and is like, oh shit, cheese seller, awesome. But then he comes back to Total Drama Action to become the man of mischief and turn everyone against each other, which is again, very unlike Owen. But he mentions the cheese seller as the reason in that episode. So clearly he still needs the money, even if he doesn't let on. And then when we see him again in the finale, he drops the little line that he already ate all the cheese in the cheese seller. What? After I cleaned out the whole cheese cellar over one ill-fated weekend, a light bulb went off in my belly. So not only are they broke, but they're also going hungry. So we see him pleading with Chris to please let him back on the show to give him another chance. He has a surprisingly good rapport with Chris and Chef, despite them breaking his jaw. And then he's kept out of All-Stars, despite very clearly being a total drama All-Star. And then when we see him again in the Redonkulous race, he's still competing on a reality show for money because he needs the money and he doesn't know anything else. It's like a guy who went to Vegas once and won big, but has since blown all his earnings and is now only constantly in the casino, hoping to strike lightning twice. It's sad. It's playing his life away. Owen got that little taste of money, but ultimately his family ended off more poor than when they started the show. And I imagine Owen feels responsible for that, or at least responsible to get the money back. So he's going in psychological. You'll notice I didn't even really mention the jaw, but that's also like a traumatic experience. The only other thing is that in Ireland, they say he has a hollow head. And then in World Tour, he says he has a hollow leg. He's just a hollow man. Just because he has a positive attitude and isn't bummed all the time doesn't mean his life isn't ruined. Most of the information I gleamed from Owen's family life came from the Total Drama Island video messages from home. These would air during commercials. I know they aired on Cartoon Network. I'm not sure if they aired on Teletoon. Because the Cartoon Network did get some exclusive content in the TDI Rundown and Spring Break 09 and 0... 10. Do people say 010? It's technically, I mean, it works, but those were all made up of reused content. The video messages from home is fresh. They aired at the end of season one, so they focused on the families of the final five, except for Lashana, where they show her friend for some reason. We also do meet Lashana's cousin, Lashaniqua, who she's very close to. Close with a cousin and no video message from your family must mean that she's not very close with her family. Maybe she doesn't have a close family, but I think it's more the former and she has a strange relationship with her family because she's very proud of the fact that she never cries. I cannot believe you've been crying. You never cry, not even at Mr. Bunny Rabbit's funeral. You nuts. I was just making sure they'd vote me the heck out of here for the night. Lashana never cries. I know you're scared, but you don't have to cry. 
I'll save you. Who said anything about crying? Lashana never cried! She lacks that emotional security, and it's very evident by the relationship she splinters throughout the series. But here's where an argument comes in. If a character gains something positive on Total Drama, and then loses that same thing on Total Drama, did they lose anything? Is it better to have loved and lost than never to have loved at all? Because if they didn't go on the show, they wouldn't have gotten it in the first place. Like Jeff, for example, we're talking about him again. He becomes close friends with Gwen, Lashana, DJ, Duncan, and Owen during Total Drama Island. But then he insults them and uses them for ratings in action. And yeah, they get revenge on him, but he never really apologizes. Like they feel better about themselves, but they don't forgive him. Except for Duncan, he just doesn't like <clears throat> women, bros before hoes guy, which is very ironic, but we'll get to that eventually. He apologizes and make things right with Bridget, but he lost all those other close friends. All he has is his girlfriend Bridget and his boyfriend on Redonculus Race. He can have both if he wants. Better to have loved and lost my ass. Losing friends hurts. A lot, especially if it's your fault from your shitty actions. He got corrupted by the total drama machine, and while in the end he did manage to break out, he still lost out on multiple potential lifelong friends. Same thing with Lashana. Everyone likes Lashana, but she's really mean to most people. Not even just in her leaked trash talk video. The only reason that video comes out is because she was being mean to Beth already. Not to say that Beth doesn't deserve it, but you know. She lies to Duncan behind his back and tries to get him voted off despite saying she's in an alliance with him. She lies to her team to go on the spa trip. But you know what? None of that matters. People do some pretty heinous shit on the show but they can always be forgiven. Perfect example, Lashana eventually forgives Heather because she's the only one that vouches for her in that big game episode. And they start to become friends by the end of action. It's actually really sweet. Until, in World Tour, Alejandra reads her like a book and plays her like a fiddle and makes her destroy multiple relationships. DJ distrusts her. She slaps the tooth out of Heather's head. Basically ending their potential friendship. We don't see them interact after that. Well, that's not true. Uh, Lashana flips her off. She still stays in the good graces of Bridget and Harold, as you can see by their awkward dance. Why don't we let Britta sing her awkward song? And in the end, she gets nothing out of it. The gross stepbrother of Better To Have Loved and Lost is getting so close to something and then having it ripped away from you. A lot of characters get screwed out of the total drama game while on the show, but not to the extent that Lashana does. Just getting booted off the island without doing anything and without knowing why, I don't blame her for tearing apart those friendships. They're bad friends. She even picks Harold over Gwen, and then we later learn that Gwen and Duncan have a thing for a while, so I can't imagine she was too happy about that. On the show, they always say, I'm not here to make friends, I'm here to win, but she didn't even win. Lashana got in the game to win money, but in the end, all she got was heartbreak and betrayal. Also, this is just a given for anyone on the show, but I imagine it's very hard to make friends and be a normal person after being on the show, especially if you were shown to be a bad friend on the show. And since we're already covering the final five with the video messages from home, let's cover Duncan. Now, Duncan is an interesting character. In this video message, we see that his mother goes easier on him and his dad kind of hates him. And we could assume that it's always been like this. Sure, he probably started as a little troublemaker, but it definitely got worse. In the Australia episode of World Tour, we see Duncan cry in a convincing manner, enough to convince Courtney. And then later in his confessional, he says that he picked up on this fake crying trick because he would use it on his mom to avoid punishment. His mom goes easy on him and lets him do whatever he wants. And probably because of that, he has a very complicated relationship with women. And that's why Gwen never really made any sense to me because prior and even during it's very evident that he much prefers train wrecks and girls that'll boss him around. And he clearly also has abandonment issues. He tells a story to Lashana later about his pet dog Petey running away and he never got over it. And every other time we see him talk about his past love life, it's absolutely bonkers. The challenge he gets booted off in in Total Drama Island is a battle of the sexes and the only reason he loses is because Heather outsmarted him by flirting with him. And by this point in the show, he should know not to trust her. <laughs> I've had tougher girlfriends than him, and uglier. I hear you. Chicks are cutthroat. I'm used to having girls yell at me, even punch me, but blank me? Really knows how to pick them. Duncan famously despises following rules, even if it's in a game he kind of likes competing in. Except for when it comes to Courtney. He stays up all night listening to her list of rules and demands and actually tries to follow them. We know that he came from Juvie, Juvenile Detention Center, which is a prison for minors. The show kind of makes it seem like he's still in Juvie actively while on the show, 
But I don't think that makes sense. But he knows because of the prison system that he will likely be back in anyway. Gwen is shocked to find out the thing that Duncan did to get thrown in juvie. But none of that really matters because the last time we see him, he gets thrown in a big boy jail because he commits an act of terror in Total Drama All-Stars. When I was thinking back to this episode, I remembered it incorrectly and thought enough time had passed that he could just be tried as an adult because he's an adult now. But when they explain it in the episode, it actually has more to do with the intensity of the crime than the age of the culprit. And when we see him in his bonus clip at the end in jail, he's writing a letter to his mommy. How sweet. So whatever he did to get in a juvie initially couldn't have been that bad. If the potential to get in big boy jail could have happened at any point in his life, it can't be that bad. Or it's at least not an act of terror. Especially if a dude like Mal was allegedly running the place and he was able to avoid him. Because Duncan has connections. In the camping episode, the one where they're camping in the woods, not every other episode. Duncan tells a scary story about a murderer who's on a loose and has a hook for a hand, and initially it just seems like a corny campfire story until later in the series we see that that murderer exists. Who, In his one line he speaks in the series says he went to prison and wants to go back to prison. He could not have been in juvie. Also, he looks 40. But how does Duncan know this guy. He's the first to point out that Gwen is in the room with a guy that clearly isn't Chef. No one else notices this. We see the murderer later as Chris hired him to be a fake cast member on Total Drama Dirtbags. And we find out later through Alejandro that the Dirtbags were not privy to that information. They were not told it was a fake show. And the next time we see the Hookman, he's in the same maximum security prison that Chris is in. He definitely went on a murder spree. He mustn't have taken the news well. But Andrew, what's the purpose of any of this? It's a misdirect. Because I could just end it there. It's a pretty shut and dry case. He entered Total Drama as a rebellious kid and left Total Drama as a felon who's in big boy jail, an adult prison. But that's where the timeline gets a little messy because we see these bonus clips at the end of each episode of the contestant that gets voted off, what happens to them after the episode. But in the final episode of All Stars, all the previous contestants from All Stars are put into balloons that are inflated by Owen's farts he's still strapped for cash. So it's only the All-Stars cast. They specifically say it's just the All-Star contestants. And then Mike and Zoe release Heather, Alejandro, Gwen, and Cameron. And then all the other characters float up into the sun. The reason the timeline is a little mangled is we see Duncan in prison after his elimination. So it's a little confusing whether he was put in that jail before or after the balloon incident. Because it does mean that Courtney, Sierra, Sam, Lightning, Joe, Scott, Lindsay, and Duncan all, you know, float away into the sky, presumably into the sun. However, every other bonus clip takes place immediately after the contestant was flushed. So we can assume that the same thing happened to Duncan. And the producers just bailed him out because they can do that. They did it with Chris just to bring him back and torture him. So either Duncan floated in a balloon up into the sun or the balloon just popped at an insanely high altitude. We've seen other contestants survive falling great heights like out of a plane, but because we haven't seen Duncan or any of the other cast members since then, I, I think they're dead. I think they're all dead. If they decide to bring any contestant back, then I will revise my list. What's more physical damage than being a corpse? I'm gonna revise it now and actually move Lindsay over to the physical side because now we know that she is dead. They always did say she was full of hot air. <clears throat> I kind of just spoiled Joe, Sam, Lightning, Scott, Sierra, and Courtney's analysis, so I'll run over them semi-quickly, or at least I will try to. However, I'm going to put Sierra and Lightning to the side for a second because they have something very important in common that I'm going to talk about later. And I'm kind of thankful for these canonical deaths because I really did not have anything to say about Joe. I like her, but you know... She's fine. And before you leave the comment, oh, but the showrunners confirmed the characters weren't dead because the fans complained. That's not in the show. I shouldn't have to go to an external source to learn something about media. If it's not in the show, it's not in the show. Did you know the Sith Eternal Fleet seen in hashtag Star Wars hashtag The Rise of Skywalker was created by Sith cultists on Exegol, who indoctrinated Exegol's population with Sith values and raised and trained their children to become officers, mechanics, and soldiers for the Final Order? No. How could we have known? Actually, Dumbledore was gay the whole time. Then why wasn't it in the book? I love Steven Universe to death and maybe someday I'll talk about it and I will always defend it. However, a lot of defenses for that show are, oh no, this isn't true because the crew explained this on a podcast. So? The crew universe said on the podcast that the denizens of the human zoo were actually there of their own volition. 
What the fuck are you talking about? What? That's way worse. Also, the mere fact that the showrunners of All Stars changed the story after getting backlash leads me to believe that they 100% intended for them to all die tragic deaths. So we're left with Scott, Courtney, and Sam. I'm gonna cover Sam because he's the simplest. Sam's psychology has more to do with Dakota than anything about himself. And that's where we rope in Dakota. What's ironic is the characters who sustain the most physical damage, I'm actually gonna talk about the least. Because there's no therapy or headcanon here we see what happens to them. Not like the therapy with Owen and Duncan while I realized halfway through writing about them that I'm writing about my... Uh, self. Dakota was a rich daddy's girl who came to Total Drama solely to get famous. But coming back after she was eliminated and becoming an intern, she got exposed to some toxic waste. Started with her losing her hair, and we will get into that. But that's not all. She got taller and greener until she fully mutated into the monster known as Dakotazoid. Mean name. And in her bonus clip, I think it's implied that she's like a spectacle professional wrestler, so you know she's not getting paid well. Even in the non-wrestling videos, I'm gonna talk about wrestling. And is now resigned to a life of circus freakery. This is the biggest and most obvious example of physical damage in the show, but I want to talk about her psychology a little bit, because why else would I be doing this? Dakota started out the show as a vain rich girl who didn't actually have anyone that close to her. And all she cared about were her looks. She thought Sam was sweet and Zoe was nice but she still didn't care about them as much as she cared about herself. But when she became an awful, ugly, terrible monster, she unlocked the ability to have a meaningful and deep relationship with Sam, who absolutely loves her, and did become friends with Zoe, who eventually viewed her as clingy and needy, but that also passed. Which is where we add Sam into this. Toxic radiation is not healthy. I shouldn't have to say this every video. You guys never listen. Stop playing in the pool. He says in the final season, his current life's goal is to get radiated so bad that he can become a monster like Dakota. So I could easily also put Sam in psychological damage because that is a damaging mindset. However, uh, he did fly into the sun. You let him go in the sun? So if the cancer couldn't get Sam, then the sun will. Ironic because the sun causes a lot of cancer. I should know. I'm... I learned last year that I'm a higher risk of getting uh, a skin thing which would have been good information to know the five years prior, I kept getting burnt. And if we're to believe that Sam is in fact dead, the Dakota Zoid, mean name, by the way, but we've been over that, has lost the only thing keeping her grounded. Uh-oh. I don't know what it says about my current stance on Total Drama that I don't really care that Duncan's dead, but I am absolutely broken that they tore Dakota's happy ending away from her. Also, she gets dumber. Like, she was ditzy earlier, but she understood grammar. Does toxic waste make you dumber? She starts saying stuff like, Me, Dakota. Sam, like Dakota. She's turning feral. Well, that was sad. But it's about to get a whole lot sadder. Scott, my favorite Revenge of the Island character and one of my favorite Total Drama characters of all time. Scott has a nearly perfect villain run in Revenge where he screws over basically every character and results in almost all the eliminations on the show. He gets one over on all the characters while also pissing off the host. Meanwhile, he's been in a rivalry with a walking shark mutant who wants his tooth back that he stole. After Scott is already very injured and voted off, Chris lets Fang, the mutated shark, ride the catapult with him and he tears Scott to shreds. Yeah, Fang had a little too much fun with him after he took the hurl of shame, so we got him this nifty trauma chair. It even has lights that blink for yes and no. Is that a yes or a no? No idea, but does anyone really care? It's Scott! <laughs> <laughs> this scared the absolute shit out of me when I was a kid. I think the implication here is that his body is busted up and cracked in on itself, and it's stuffed inside the box. But the box is so small. Legitimately, at the time, I believed he was just a head and a spine kept alive in agonizing pain with that box. This is the most brutal villain dethronement in the show. Maybe number two. But like number one, Alejandro and the Darth Vader total drama machine, we see these characters as okay later. This would be a very easy straight to physical damage character, but we see him fully healed in all stars. Well, physically healed at least. In Revenge of the Island, Scott is a slapstick cartoon, but he's still very capable. In All Stars, Scott is so traumatized by what happened that he's reverted to a sniveling mess. Revenge Scott went out by himself into the forest every night. All Star Scott is afraid of his own shadow. That is until he meets Courtney, who by bossing him around, gets his confidence back. 
I'm playing with these like they're puppets. Now kiss. And allows him to go out again every night to the spooky island. A spooky island without any more mutants, but a spooky island nonetheless. And in the end, all would be well for Scott if he just kept Courtney. But he didn't do that. Okay, so <laughs> in All Stars, Courtney makes a visual list of who she's going to vote off in what order. And she draws Scott as a rat, which is apparently the final straw for him. Which means that he probably would have been left as a sniveling mess for a very, very, very long time with post-traumatic stress disorder. Or he would have had he not died in the sun. But if you don't like the balloon ending, then he still goes in psychological damage. Same thing with Sam. So if you canonically, if you don't believe the balloon ending that they all died, tragic deaths, everyone is still up on the board. That's why I explained contingency. Same with Duncan as well. I know I just put him up there, but I really want to talk about Scortney for a second. Yes, I said Scortney. A lot of people have a problem with this ship because they prefer Courtney and Duncan or Scott and Dawn or Courtney and Gwen. <laughs> But I love it. It's my favorite part of All Stars, and I think it actually makes sense for both these characters, despite almost everyone having a weird character choice in that season. Scott grew up in a matriarch-centered family, so being bossed around by a woman makes sense to him. He prefers it, and honestly, I will say nothing. I will keep my words to myself. Listen up, farm boy! Cameron kissed me! And now he's gone, so we're back together. End of story. Now let's go! Can't help it. I loves me a bossy lady. So of course it makes sense for him to be with Courtney and show his softer side because she's a bossy woman. He likes being bossed around. They're perfect. <sighs> bossy enough to control Duncan, a guy who hates rules. And in that way, Scott and Duncan are similar. They both like being bossed around by women. And in the end, both of their downfalls are kind of tied to the same woman. Multiple times over, women are their downfall, whether that's romantic or otherwise. Even in World Tour, Heather has more to do with Duncan being booted than Alejandro. Heather, Beth, Heather again, Gwen, and Courtney. Scott got booted because of Zoe. And we've covered Duncan and Scott a lot, so let's move on to Courtney now. I know talking about a female character only in the context of who she's with and the man she impacts is a very annoying way to consume media and discuss media. However, Courtney's relationships are very important to her character. Courtney initially likes Duncan because he is a taste of the life she's never experienced. He's dangerous. But like most that fall down this path, she wants to keep him around without compromising herself. It's the I can fix him fallacy. We're covering a lot of topics in this video. No one's going to be happy about this. Everyone's going to be mad. And it's not because you can't fix him, it's just ignorant to think that he wants or needs to be changed. Yeah, I'm talking to you watching this. Duncan has a weakness for women, but Courtney prefers the company of men. And what we learn about Courtney's home life and school life is that she had a debate partner that she trashed because she thought she didn't need, and she was in a band that failed because they all wanted to be lead singer. She has a friendship with Bridget for a while, but that ultimately fizzles out. In World Tour, she finally decides to open herself up to her first real female friend. And that ends horribly. Multiple times over. So when Duncan does what she says, or Alejandro showers her with compliments, or Scott becomes her willing servant, it pleases her. But after getting booted off the show in an unfair way, she becomes obsessed with fairness and plays the game in a much more cutthroat manner. So much so that she trashes everyone that tries to get close to her all in lieu of her strategy. She ends the show with no friends, no meaningful relationships, is shown as hard to work with on one of the most popular shows in canon, and she has a very, very, very public breakup. She even gets out lawyered by Duncan during their custody battle, and that's her thing. And in drama, 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 island, and action, she gets to show how athletic she is. But over time, she loses that. She begins to become uncoordinated and just worse at the game. She even notably in World Tour claims she has a strong stomach and proves that by eating all the disgusting food in the China challenge and not even cringing a little bit. And then she can't even eat some dang poop ice cream at All Stars. This is a weird show. I should have known that when all the characters died in the sun. But with saying that, on top of everything she's gone through, she floats into the sun. And just in case you don't believe or want to believe that the balloons in fact killed them, she would still be on the board. That's why I explained them in detail. They're all severely broken people, except for Joe. Aside from dying, Joe is fine. Now the board's starting to even out. We put Lightning and Dakota to the side. So as of right now, the only Revenge of the Island character we haven't talked about is Mike. So let's talk about Mike. I've been holding this character off for a long time because it's 
confusing because he has what they call in the show multiple personality disorder and then he hits a big red button and then he doesn't anymore and then there is an evil version of him i feel like the general consensus of this character is it's a good idea with bad execution or that it's offensive which is fair most of the stuff they said about did is wrong but in their defense no shows got it right. I was super into it because in the scene in Revenge of the Island when Mike finally stands up to his other personalities, we see a shadowy, creepy Mike for like a frame. And I remember seeing that and going frame by frame trying to find it and watching all these theory videos about what this evil shadowy Mike could be. I also watched a lot of AMVs of that playing with the animal I have become. It's a good time to be on the internet, not like now. It used to be a proper country. I also did the same thing when Slender Man appeared in the show. That That's real, I didn't edit that, that actually happened. I don't have a place for it on this board, but just know that Slender Man is a creature that exists in the Total Drama universe along with Bigfoot, aliens, and mutants. Also, if I sound a little worse or different, it's because when I'm filming this, the air is, um, on fire, full of smoke. It's been a while, I think I've earned it. I think it's finally time. I think we're finally back. Wouldn't be a Total Drama video without it. Ah, the summer of BH Ultra continues. I wanna put this here, but not in a way where it like looks like a brand. So I'll face it the other way. No, I'll put it somewhere else. I didn't think this through. Total Drama, this series, is portrayed like an in-universe reality TV show. So all the things we see are being filmed by real cameras in their world, except for when we need to go inside a character's head. Whether that's a dream or a hallucination or a man physically fighting off his alternate personalities, this might be a leap and a stretch for speculation, but I'm going to assume that the footage we see inside Mike's mind are not meant to be literal. They are a visual aid to help explain what's going on inside his head mentally. However, there's a point where little brain Mike yells out to Izzy through Mal's eyes and Izzy says, who's Mal? And that's the only way she could have possibly known about Mal. Except for the fact that Mal spoke in the confessionals already by this point. Anyone who watched the show would have known that. In Total Drama Action, the contestants watch the terrible things Lashana said about them in a behind the scenes clip on the Total Drama website. Which leads me to believe that this show is recorded at least a couple episodes before they air. Near the tail end of World Tour, there's a guy who works at a fireworks stand in the middle of nowhere. We don't have time to unpack that. And when Sierra speaks to him, we learn that he's a huge Total Drama fan, or at least watches the show regularly. He knows about the people on the show, but he doesn't know that Cody and Heather are competing against each other. Even if Izzy didn't watch the show on her own and it doesn't air episodes ahead of time, we know that Izzy would have access to all the footage as the powers that be the producers like adding her to stuff to stir the pot. She purposefully causes drama, even in Revenge of the Island. This is just a very roundabout way for me to say that the little scenes and clips we see that take place inside Mike's head didn't actually happen. They are just what Mike thinks and feels at the time. So that leads us to the big important question. Is this red button real? In a literal sense, no. I don't think there is an actual big red button inside his head, but I do think it's meant to convey something real. Regardless of how it works, the mechanics of the button, even if it is real or isn't real, we know that it does work. Mike no longer has his multiple personalities and it's all because of his experiences and growth on Total Drama. Happy ending, right? It's either the button is real and it did physically what it said or it's metaphorical, but it still mentally did what it said. Regardless, what they say when they hit the button is that it's gonna reset his brain. I don't know what the implications of doing that can be, but they're not good. Most people who actually have DID don't view it as a curse or a death sentence. It's actually very nice because they have a built-in support system, that's what they're there for, for support, that most people don't have. Also, it's worth noting that DID is most often caused by a traumatic event, mostly during childhood development, which Mike never talks about, even to the girl who he trusts more than anything, but in his defense, the cameras are always on him, so I wouldn't say that either, because I, being a fan of the show, I'm like, oh, why can't we hear about all the trauma in his past life? Of course he wouldn't want to say anything. Freaks like me are out there. Andrew, he's not, you know he's not real, right? But maybe Mike doesn't even know what his trauma was and built up these multiple personalities as a defense mechanism so he doesn't have to. And now that's gone, 
So he's left on his own. The second he steps off that island and makes his way home, I feel like he's gonna have an awful time. Mike developed a personality that was evil and mean, so mean and evil and bossy that he was put into juvie and people feared him there. Again, I don't want anyone to take this super literally or at face value because I am not an expert. I am no mental health expert. If you want actual information about this stuff, please seek out a professional. Do not go to me for advice with this stuff because I just know what I've heard and what I've researched and maybe the articles aren't to be believed. But in this show, to develop a personality that strong and forward thinking and powerful, something really terrible must have happened. But if you don't believe any of that and you think Mal is just an evil guy and the personalities just work like cartoon characters, then I have something for that too. And that's completely fair and completely valid. Again, for some reason in these total drama videos, I keep talking about legitimate mental health disorders and I'm not an expert. I have like one or two of them and there's thousands. But I know, and you should too, that people with DID are not monsters. But if we are to believe the logic of the show, if we're going full fucking cartoon, and we are to believe that Mal is dangerous and evil, the good thing about having all these personalities separate is that when Mike is Mike, he can still be himself. Other personalities may take over for the time being, but when Mike is in charge, nothing changes. Um, except. Check it out. I have all the skills my personalities had. Sorry. All his personalities? So he's got Chester's rage, Manitoba's sexism, Vito's douchebaggery. Don't think of it as getting rid of us for good. We'll all still be a part of you in a while. Also, Mal disappeared, faded away, just like all the other personalities. He didn't die any more or less than they did. So somewhere in this new and improved Mike that has all the abilities of his personalities, there are little sprinkles of Mal. And if Mal is truly evil, some of those tendencies now exist in Mike. And none of this would have happened if he never joined Total Drama. To psychological you go. If I cover all the newer cast members really quick, then I can move on to the beloved cast members and just the ones I've been thinking about and watching since I was a kid. Rodney is not an unintelligent person. He just gets very flustered by pretty women. He's like Scott except not a little bastard man. Rodney is not a dumb hick, but he was portrayed like one on one of the most popular shows in that universe, all because you got distracted by pretty ladies. Trust me, everyone believing you're dumb weighs on your psyche a lot. Going in psychological. I just put him under here, but I would love to see Rodney interact with Gwen. Can a goth girl and a country boy truly find love? Ella. This one's just sad. It's strange because I've only watched Pocketail Island twice, but I had two very differing opinions the two separate times I watched it. At the time, when I first saw it, I didn't like it because it seemed like the worst total drama could get. And I liked it more this time around because I learned that no, it could always get worse. I didn't like the cartoony characters that were barely even characters. Not like the beloved character, Harold, we've been watching since the beginning. You know Harold's final line was in the finale of World Tour in 2010? That makes me sick. But upon this year's rewatch, I watched every season. And not only that, but I watched them before this video, watched them as if I had never seen them before. I realized that all the characters started out like that. They just needed more time to develop. And Ella did develop. She started off as a generic princess archetype. Then as the series went on, she got injured, betrayed, heartbroken, and then eliminated unfairly. And she's the only one on that damn island that I cared about, and it made me legit sad. Ella suffered on Pocketail Island, but she still keeps her positive demeanor. She even gets to leave on her own terms as she's lightly lowered into the cannon. But I'm still really sad for her. Also, she technically got injured. Survived it just fine, with only minor damage to the base of my spine. She may never recover. Physical damage. You can tell whose kids are the parents' favorites by how they treat them. Beardo can die tragically, but if anything happens to Ella, I will Also, when Total Drama first came out, it was not popular among the internet community. Partially because a lot of people just believed it was a Drawn Together ripoff. And I never really watched Drawn Together, but I have seen clips and... Uh, not beating the allegations with that character. Uh, Topher. I'm going in elimination order. I'll get more into it with another surprise character later, but Topher's a really interesting case. The purpose of this video is to track how Total Drama ruined all the contestants that were on it. But in this case, Topher being ruined by the show actually has nothing to do with him being on the show. Ever since the show started, Topher has become obsessed, but not with becoming rich or famous or winning, but with becoming the host. Aside from the first couple seasons, Total Drama 
Kamigawa doesn't really have a set timeline, but we can assume that the teens on Pocketail Island watched the first season when they were younger. Even if the same amount of time that passed in real life passed during the show, and they're 16 on the show, they still would have been like 11 or 12 when they watched it. Clearly something about watching Total Drama from a young age imprinted on Topher that the host Chris McLean is someone to be admired and looked up to. Topher's only goal is to grow up and be the next Total Drama host. And we know that this is the final Total Drama season in the original canon, but we still never see him after this. His life and future prospects have been ruined by this show even before he stepped foot on the island. How sad. It's very funny though that I'm talking about the effects of uh, watching Total Drama from a young age and... I mean, which leads us into... Wait a minute, Andrew, did you just say original canon? Priya. And you guys thought I wasn't gonna talk about it, huh? I've been writing this video for a long time. I mean, I said earlier that I've been planning it since last July. While wrapping up this video, I got a notification from the Total Drama YouTube channel, which turns out is not official and not affiliated with the brand in any way. Fresh TV just let these guys post their episodes on YouTube. They posted a community post that said, yeah, um, the new season of Total Drama comes out in Italy in like a couple weeks. What? And I was determined to not be spoiled this time. Every single season of Total Drama has been spoiled for me. To be fair, some of it is my fault. I watched Island in Action episodes that were just ripped and put on YouTube before they aired on Cartoon Network. Hey Ultra Urs, Editor Andrew here. I don't know where else to put this, and it happened while I was editing this, so I just decided to put it right after I talk about the show airing on Cartoon Network. I mentioned in previous videos that on the side, I'm working on archiving as much footage of this era of Cartoon Network I could find from 2008 to early 2010. And I've mostly been using YouTube rips or stuff I could just stumble across on other secondary websites. But because of this, a lot of people have reached out to me and actually sent me rips that I have not seen before, full television rips. And while I was working on this video and after I announced it, a benevolent fan reached out to me and sent me a collection of every new episode of Total Drama Island as they aired on Cartoon Network, like the actual television rips from each of those days. And for those of you who know, who watched a lot of my videos, you know they aired on Har Har Thursdays, and there was an event called Star Star Stars Days, which I talk about a lot. And initially when I went to it, I thought like, okay, this is just gonna be the episode where Lindsay gets voted off, but I can see it in four by three, and it's gonna have that TV grain to it and the logo in the bottom. This is gonna be really cool. But then I loaded up the file and realized that the rip actually starts with the commercial break of Thumb Wars, which shows the puppet Yoda, which I wasn't even certain aired on television, saying, touch your tongue to mine, which I also wasn't sure aired on television. So now both of those things have been proven because of this rip, because of this fan. And also the cool thing is between Har Har Thursday's commercial breaks and because Total Drama is a 22 minute show, it had a commercial break in the middle. It would use clips from those episodes and use sound effects, but during Star Star Stars Days, they use Star Wars sound effects. <laughs> So I don't know what I'm gonna do with all the in-betweens. I obviously can't upload the entire rips because that's there's television copyrighted material in it. But maybe I'll get the in-between Harar Thursday's little sound effect bits that I've been looking for for a really long time. I'll upload them on the bonus channel, maybe, if that's what people want. I don't know. I, I guess you guys decide what you want me to do with these. I was given these, but not under like secrecy. Like nobody told me like, oh, but make sure nobody knows you have this. Like it's just television rips. Whatever you guys want me to do with them within reason. Just let me know. And I didn't want to get spoiled for World Tour, but I did want to listen to all the songs because I love cartoon musical numbers. I'm sure you guys knew that. For whatever reason, it never occurred to me as a kid that the songs would then give away the elimination order because they wouldn't have the previous person in the next song. Which led to a funny situation where Cody isn't present in the wake up song. So between the previous song and that, Blainly, Courtney, and Cody all disappear. I thought I missed multiple songs. Anyway, so for days following April 10th, everyone on the internet was scrambling to find and watch these episodes. Do you guys have a link? Where are you getting these clips from? Has anybody seen the show? Do you guys see the weird fart episode? That was weird, right? Hey, Ultra Urs, it's editor Andrew again. Back at it again. You can tell how defeated I am. 
because I couldn't find any footage of this new season because obviously I couldn't download it because it's just the, the actual show and it's not shown anywhere like the original Total Drama episodes where they're all just uploaded on YouTube. So I had to look for specific clips by searching them up. So for that, uh, that one joke, that throwaway joke where I talk about the farting episode, I had to look up basically that exact thing and the only, the best footage I could find is in a video called Total Drama Island 2023 Girls Fart Compilation. So... I'm very proud of this community. You guys, I need to go cry. I'm writing this video way ahead of time. So this just happened to me. It's still possible that even right now when this video comes out, that a majority of you haven't seen the new season. And this video is about how all of these characters end off. So if you haven't seen the new season, timestamp, spoilers start now. Okay, we're good. Everyone that wanted to leave has left. These characters are not done. We will return to this board. If we put these guys on the board, the board is going to change because they are all confirmed to return in a potential season two. Because it took two years after the season was initially announced for it to drop, it shadow dropped on an Italian TV channel. The Discovery and Warner Media merger has done irreparable damage. I've talked about it before. I probably will talk about it again, but it may not even matter because this season is very different. We see a couple cameos like a mask of Owen, a zombie that looks like Sean. I think we even see the daters on an airplane, but these are all in the first episode. But after that, we don't see anything else specific. We know that these characters have seen previous seasons of Total Drama, but how? Because at the end of All Stars, the island sinks to the bottom of the ocean, and now it's just back in the new season and nobody really acknowledges it. And don't get me started on the host. Chef doesn't act like he does in previous seasons. He acts and dresses more like someone who runs a daycare. Right? And as most people have pointed out, Chris McLean sounds completely different. I'm your host, Chris McLean, and this is Total Drama Island. Hey, what's up? I'm here to slay. This isn't a complaint, and it's definitely not the voice actor's fault. He does a tremendous job and has the insurmountable task of taking over the role of a beloved voice. However, it is different, which leads me to believe that Total Drama Island 2023 takes place in a separate universe. I tried to split them in half, but all I got was Z, M, K, and... I forget which one it is, the gay one. A different timeline, maybe, but different continuity for sure. A timeline where they never dumped a ton of toxic waste on the island and it never fell into disarray and then sunk to the bottom of the ocean. That island was fracked until it sank. It's unclear if this means that only the original island season is canon or if none of it's canon. I mean, Owen exists, maybe. And if they call this Total Drama Island, it makes more sense for it just to be original Total Drama Island and new Total Drama Island in this continuity. Because with like Big Brother, they don't call it Big Brother and then the second season's Biggest Brother. It's just Big Brother season one and Big Brother season two. But real quick, I'm gonna talk about how some of these characters were ruined, but it's a completely different continuity from this board and they will come back. So the board will be outdated anyway. So they're not going on the board. Nichelle has outed herself to her mindless fans and potentially ruined her career. Julia also ruined her career and completely killed her influencer character to all of her fans publicly, she can never go back. Damien, like Scott, started out confident, but then being on the island for long enough was resorted to a sniveling, disastrous, scared mess. So much so that he would rather leave the island than compete for the money. MN Chase. <laughs> I swear to God, I picked up the Emma and Chase ones. Okay, yeah, so Emma and Chase, Emma and Chase both got out of toxic relationships uh, with each other before the show started, but then both being on the show, they met back up and connected again, linked back up, and they are both worse off for it. This isn't like a permanent injury, but Ripper consumed a tapeworm? Those are not easy to get out. Julia812, that's two people that ate a parasite that's famous for starving people. But that's okay because the physical injuries were sustained by Wayne and Raj, my favorite new characters. But we do see them being okay later, but that stuff sticks with you. They've probably been injured a lot, but never that bad. I think Scary Girl is a demon. Also, she has a name, but they just call her Scary Girl. Which leads us back to Priya, the girl whose life has been dominated by total drama. From the moment she was born, her parents forced this life upon her. She never had a chance to do anything else. The show kind of portrays Millie as in the wrong for feeling bad for her that she never got a chance at a normal life, but she's 
Right. This is wrong. Like Topher, it wasn't being on the show that ruined her life. It was the show's existence in general. Bria never got a chance at a normal life. She did win, but Moni only lasts so long, and now that we know there's gonna be a second season, I'm sure she will lose it in between. She never learned any proper life skills. And I didn't either, but, you know, I figured it out. All she knows is total drama, and when the show inevitably ends again, she will be nothing. Let's see if she even keeps that money on the next season of Total Drama. I just wanna say this, the two choices are either the next season is Total Drama, something like a completely different thing, but the cooler thing to do would be, they already did Total Drama Island 2. I mean, they did Total Drama Island a lot. They keep going back to that island. It's like the green hill zone of Total Drama. But I think it would be cool if they did Total Drama action again, but with these characters. It's retreading ground, but I think it would be fun. Hey, everyone that just skipped the spoiler section, um, Max and Scarlet are gonna go to jail. Like, everyone believes that Scarlet was always evil and that she went to the island while plotting her plan. Like, it was a rich, she was gonna do that the whole time. But I believe that being on the island stuck that long with Max pushed her to the edge. She committed an act of terror, and whether Max actually had anything to do with it or not, he is considered an accomplice. These two are now enemies of the country. They're definitely worse off, but I don't know if I would... I mean, it causes mental distress, I suppose. I pinned Scarlet Max with the same pin, so they're stuck together, because I like irony. Even funnier, even Katie and Sadie have their own pins. We only have so many characters left, so we might as well wrap up the pocket tail boys and girlies. I really hate to admit defeat like this, ignore the okay corner, but Sugar? Completely fine. People really want her to come back, or they wanted her to come back. I don't know how these characters work in the new continuity. There's a very slim chance, but maybe someday Sugar will return, and then something terrible will happen to her, so we can put her on the board. Let's hope. Similarly, Sean and Jasmine. Now, initially, my point was going to be that the show enabled Sean's delusions, but there's nothing actually in the show that supports that. I was gonna drag Jasmine down too into this category because now that she's with him, she has to deal with those delusions. But actually, I do think there's a reality out there where Jasmine manages to get Sean to drop the whole zombie act, and then they live happily together, each with $500,000. She even starts to get through to him by the end of the show. So congratulations, Sean and Jasmine. Despite being in every single episode of Pocketail Island, you come out relatively unscathed. They truly were survivors. That's not the name of the show. But real quick, if Sean has seen every zombie movie, do you think he's seen Chris's badminton movie? It's not badminton, it's goodminton. Heck, it's greatminton. So let's get into relationship drama. They don't call it total drama for nothing. Sky intended to break up with her boyfriend back home before leaving for the show but she didn't. And then she met a charming, cute guy that she liked, and even though it was for a challenge, she did end up kissing him. Although the intention was still there, even if it's not partially Dave's fault, if not entirely Dave's fault, she still cheated on her boyfriend. On national TV. It's international, Jeff. Total drama is seen all over the world. Oh. Or sorry, international TV. Even the people in Italy watching the show bootleg style saw it. And that's not just me theorizing to the extreme again. They say that on the show which means it's true. It means that everyone saw it. She was gonna dump him anyway, but now there's no chance he'll take her back. And now everyone back home is gonna know her as the burping cheater. And to me, that sounds like psychological torment. I'm being very lax with the term torment now. You could tell how hard it was to categorize the Pocketail characters. Hey, wait a minute, Andrew. Aren't you forgetting a Pocketail Island character? No. I'm sorry that the last couple characters seemed a little ham-fisted or I just gave up on them. It's because they were only around for one season and it's hard to categorize them because they don't really get endings. But the rest of the characters are OG characters, so I have a lot to say about all of them. Except for Bridget. You could say the same thing that we said about Sky that she tried to cheat on her man on national TV. Actually, she did international TV. They say that in the song, uh, but he forgave her. Then I was gonna go back to the well of well. The last time we canonically saw her, she exploded in Revenge of the Island, but I feel like if she died tragically in an explosion, Jeff would have at least mentioned it on the Redonkulous Race. I didn't watch it, but I know he didn't say that. But we could argue maybe she lost her way uh, like Jeff, but no, she actually owns a couple animal sanctuaries. And that's it. She always liked animals since the beginning, but she was never this hands-on. Like she feels guilty about something. Well, for one, when DJ is injuring animals in World Tour, and we will get to that very shortly, she doesn't seem that concerned. Like she complains about it, yeah, but she doesn't really care about solving the problem as much as DJ does. And on top of that, she's a vegetarian and the show makes her eat meat, even more meat than the average meat eater would be okay with. Like I eat meat, not as much as I probably should, as you could tell by the width of my arm, 
<laughs> and I would find eating dolphin meat and bull testicles as immoral, if not just gross. I don't know what it feels like to be a vegetarian and be forced to eat meat. And I probably never will. But I'm going to go out on a limb and say it probably feels bad. Psychological damage. She's going to spend the rest of her life trying to forgive herself, but she never will. Which is good for the planet, but bad for her brain. Let's put her right next to Jeff. I put her between Jeff and Noah because I, uh, that's, that's a good, that's a love triangle waiting to happen. And speaking of curses, the final OG characters before we get to the final category, Beth and DJ. I said earlier that this video is basically just an outlet for a bunch of mini theories I developed upon watching the show again that I didn't think would warrant their own videos. And I gotta say, I think both their curses are bogus. I mean, I think real world curses are bogus too, but this is a cartoon. In season one, Total Drama Island, Beth takes a cursed totem from Boney Island and curses her whole team and then they lose, and when they find out, they boot her off. A couple things. One, Chris specifically says you will be cursed forever. If you take anything off the island, you'll be cursed forever. Which would imply that if Beth was in fact cursed, that she would remain cursed for the rest of her life, even after the contestants ripped up the totem and put him back on the island. There are two episodes she is featured in after taking the totem. They are Paintball Deer Hunter and If You Can't Take the Heat. They lose both those challenges and then Beth is promptly booted off, but I don't buy it. The episode immediately after the when she gets the totem is the episode she finally stands up for herself and escapes Heather's alliance. And they lose because they end up getting into a paint fight with each other. Also, Cody gets mauled by a bear. Then in the next episode, let's be honest, I love him to death, but it's almost entirely Owen's fault. Owen chucks a crate at Trent's head, potentially giving him brain damage, and then eats the team's entire spread. Heather's eyebrows explode off of her head because Lindsay messed up the flambe, and then Lashana locks her in the freezer. None of these things, mind you, have anything to do with Beth. The curse is supposed to make bad things happen to specifically Beth because she stole it, but honestly, Beth is living her best life. She's thriving. As bad things happen to to the people around her. I don't doubt that that totem has mystical powers, but I don't think Chris is being honest about how those powers work because we know that Chris lies. Oh yeah, that, yeah. I lied. So what if, and stick with me here, what if the totem doesn't actually bring bad luck, but instead brings good fortune to the person who stole it by sapping positive energy from those around them and thus breeding bad luck to those around the person who currently holds it? And if we are to believe it's forever, what if the curse never left her? Because in the next season, Total Drama Action, a season full of misfortune and injuries, who makes it to the very end by flying under the radar? Beth. Nobody questioned it until now, because how would you even explain it? But in half of the ending, she wins a million dollars. One million dollars that she goes on to lose. Maybe the totem curse doesn't last forever. And again, Chris lies. But what if it lasts only so long? Because action takes place mere days after Island. A world tour is a decent time skip. I can imagine that the curse or the fortune would at least last until the end of the summer. Ever since Beth stole that totem, she has had insane luck. She managed to stand up for herself to a bully, something she could never Ever do prior. She almost and possibly did win a million dollars. She met up with a handsome model man who became her committed boyfriend and again no one questioned it. But that leads us to the host Chris McLean. What advantage does he get from lying about the totem? Why would Chris specifically not want any of the contestants to pick up a totem that could potentially bring them good luck and cause misfortune to those around them? Like all the teens on the show constantly. My theory, the big theory of this video, and it's not even on the board, is that Chris McLean has been stealing the totems from the island and preventing other people from taking them because he's been using them to bring misfortune to those around him, thus upping ratings and increasing his career while also bringing good fortune to himself. That would explain why Boney Island is so close in proximity to the island he decided to have his show on and why he keeps going back there. And if we are to believe our Beth hypothesis, then we know that the totem can still work even if it's cut up into little bits, which is how it is the last time we see it in Island. So if Chris McLean wanted to sap these totems power, but discreetly, he could, in theory, hypothetically, crush it up into little bits and put it in some kind of jewelry to keep on his person. Like, say, a mysterious sack he wears around his neck. You guys ever wonder 
what was in that sack. But remember, the curse does eventually wear off and you will be left the same as you were before the curse or enchantment started. Or will you? Because after action, Beth doesn't just have normal Beth luck again, she has distinctly bad luck. She loses all her winnings after falling over with her friend in France. And then she missed out on winning even more money because she randomly decided to go look for help with Jeff and Trent. She went from a potential season two winner to not even being featured in the competition in season three. What an insane downgrade. Okay, so unless you continue procuring more totems, which we know there are multiple of, you will have terrible luck. You will come crashing down. It's like hard drugs. It may feel good and better for a little, but after a while, you will never be normal again. So Beth is going to physical because technically it has nothing to do with her mentality. It's just an aura that surrounds her for the rest of her life. And that's all well and good because that's why I started this video. But real quick, I'd like to get to the bottom of this Chris theory. Chris needs to keep getting these totems regularly to keep himself fresh and prevent him from crashing into bad luck. It's why we keep driving back to Wawanaqua even in action. It's just over there. And I'm sure before flying away from the island, he procured enough totems to last him the entire plane ride the whole season. But... The plane explodes. So then, of course, immediately after that, we return to the island again. But this time, Chris implements a new rule to the game. Whoever finds these McLean invincibility statues that are hidden around the island gets invincibility. And where is this idol hidden in Total Drama All-Stars? Inside Boney Island. But these totems look like Chris, and the original Tiki totem didn't. But to be fair, so does a uh, plant, and I really don't want to live in a world where Chris canonically fucked that plant. So technically, I'm going back on what I said. Beth's curse is real. It's just not the curse that the show said it was. However, DJ's curse is entirely bullshit. Devin Joseph is a graceful and confident man that gets significantly less graceful and confident as the show goes on. But he's also very much a mama's boy. In a weird turn of events, he's one of the few contestants whose parents we actually meet, but we still know very little about them, or rather about her. We see his mother and we see that those two are very close whenever he's not in the game. And as a fellow raised by women guy, I know it when I see it. But this also means he lacks a strong father figure in his life and he really wants one, which explains why in Total Drama Island, despite being notably a really nice guy and becoming friends with him later on in the series, he agrees to and participates in mercilessly bullying Harold. He wants Duncan to think he's cool. He likes listening to him and doing what he says. And it's the same reason he agrees to be in an illegal alliance with Chef in action. He wouldn't have done that otherwise. He craves that father figure, despite looking for it in the wrong places. In the third episode of Action, he is shown to be very proficient in makeup and baking cookies, to which Chef lashes out at him and wants him to be more of a man. But he feels so bad due to his mama guilt that he decides to quit the game, which is common for him. DJ lost in three seasons, and he was never voted off in a single one of them. And then in World Tour, DJ believes Alejandro when he tells him that the fish with the emblem on it lifted his curse, despite not believing it when Heather says the exact same thing. And side note, it's worth noting that for whatever reason, throughout the entire series, Heather's actually pretty nice to DJ. Like, Cody thinks he's the only one that Heather's been relatively nice to, uh, but she's been mean to him. In the first spooky episode aired in October, she tries to calm DJ down after he runs into the bathroom screaming. And then in the second spooky episode aired in October, she asks DJ if he's okay, which she hasn't to any other character prior or since. And then there's an entire episode in World Tour where Heather keeps fighting to keep DJ in the game. Of course, it's to gain an extra ally and have an alliance to help herself get farther in the game, but there's history there. You want to see a really weird thing I noticed in the first ever episode of Total Drama? Heather walks onto the dock wearing sunglasses, and there are four characters that appear in the reflection of those sunglasses. Beth and Lindsay, the girls who went on to become her alliance members and eventually turn on her, Gwen, her notable rival who they've been feuding with for years, and DJ. Heather and DJ have some sort of connection that I only really noticed upon the most recent rewatch. I think it's sweet. And yet DJ does not believe her. He only believes Alejandro, a dominant male figure. And a lot of the curse has to do with DJ's perception. Because again, you notice things upon rewatch after having already seen the later seasons. If you didn't know, 
I don't know how you got this far in the video, but also a lot of the people that watched the Izzy video uh, went on to tell me in the comments that they had never seen Total Drama before, but still liked the video, which is confusing to me. If you don't know, in Total Drama World Tour, DJ crumbles a mummy puppy or a puppy mummy, and then is cursed to injure animals at every single location they go in every subsequent episode. And it's not on purpose, but he does keep accidentally hurting these animals. It is him that's doing it. But what's interesting is when Alejandro makes him believe that the curse is lifted, the curse is lifted. He doesn't hurt any more animals. But the second Alejandro makes him believe that the curse is real again, animals immediately get hurt. Which kind of implies that it's more of a mind over matter situation. It's not a curse, it's a placebo. But then you go back and watch World Tour again and realize that animals don't start getting hurt until after DJ starts to consider the consequences of crumbling this puppy mummy or this mummy puppy. But Andrew, if animals only get hurt if DJ believes he's cursed, how did he disintegrate the dog in the first place? Well, one, the dog's not real, and two, if we are to believe that the curse is real, then who would possibly get the curse if breaking the dog is the way you get the curse, but isn't part of the curse? Sorry, let me explain that a little better. And this is if we are to believe the curse is real, which it isn't. You get the curse by crumbling the dog. And if you want to argue that how could he have known and hurt that animal if he didn't know about the curse yet? but you need to crumble the dog to get the curse. So anyone who touched it would have broken it. It has nothing to do with the curse. You get the curse after touching it. And three, the big piece of evidence, this isn't the first time this has happened. Because again, when you rewatch the series, knowing where the characters will end up, you begin to notice some things. Because the same bad luck resulting in him accidentally hurting animals also happens in season one, where he launches Bunny, his pet bunny, into the air. And then in action. Oh no, don't expect me to. What if the trailer slips and rolls back down the hill and possibly hurts someone? What then? Hmm. That's really specific. Is that a regular occurrence for you? So it's my belief that on top of this, DJ's gracefulness is tied to his self-worth. When he feels down on himself or stressed, he becomes a bumbling oaf. He's a teenage ballet er, ballet person, a ballet dancer. So that means he's gotta be pretty good at it or at least a little okay. But when we see him in the season one talent show, he sucks at it. In general, the longer the show goes on, the more uncoordinated he gets. And most of the animal injuries come from him being clumsy more than unlucky. The show Total Drama has made Devin Joseph doubt himself so much that he becomes literally and figuratively unstable. And again, when he believes he's cursed, animals get hurt and then he leaves the show still believing the curse. And we never see DJ resolve this or grapple with this. Every day going forward, DJ is going to struggle with his personal ability to do anything. And also, you know, animals are gonna be at a very high risk of being around this guy, which will probably weigh on him mentally as well. We see how distressed he is in World Tour. If we are to believe the curse is real, then he goes in physical with Beth, but if we are to believe it isn't real and it's a placebo and it's all about doubting himself, we put him in therapy. And with that, we're down to our final eight contestants who are all going into the physical deformities pile. Some have had worse deformities than others, and others didn't stay forever. And despite their physical damages healing, they are all resorted to the greatest punishment and embarrassment known to the Total Drama universe. Every Star Wars story suffers a character losing a hand. Every Joss Whedon story has a nerd falling into a hot woman's bazongas or boobies. They all suffer a great loss. Some stories have lost take the shape of a loved one, an opportunity that feeling of home we all desire, but Total Drama charts loss differently. And that's why our final eight contestants, Heather, Stacy, Lightning, Ezekiel, Alejandro, Dave, Dakota, and Sierra. They are all here, put in the same category, together. Sure, Alejandro was burned alive and shoved into a robot for a year. Sure, Dakota becomes this mutated freak giant and is stuck like that for the rest of her life. Sure, Ezekiel is resorted to a feral freak monster creature. But the main big loss that all these characters, all eight of them suffer, the thing that binds them together, the worst loss in Total Drama history, is they all lose their hair. Oh, your highness, I'm sure it's not that noticeable. Ah! It all happens on a popular show, on a public forum, potentially in front of millions of people. And you may think that doesn't sound bad, and that some of these characters actually suffered worse fates that are physical permanent 
deformities. But in Total Drama World, this is the worst thing that could ever happen. Do you know what that's like? What that feels like? Truly, do you know? Have you ever experienced that? Having the one thing about you that everyone mentions, that everyone comments on, that everyone constantly talks about, your defining feature, not the content of your person or the words you say or the way you say them or the things you feel. It's that physical thing. The one physical thing that people always point out, always compliment or insult or say it's distracting, always the same thing. It's that one thing. That's the content of your character. Imagine losing that one thing, the one thing that makes you your own person, that makes you stand out, that's such an integral part of your identity that people have gotten used to, that thing, your hair, that becomes an extension literally and physically of yourself. Do you know what it's like to go bald? in front of potentially millions of people in a public forum, in front of all those viewers, could you possibly know what that feels like? I think I get it now. This is a very big commitment for a couple second bit. But I'm an erratic guy. Sometimes you wake up in the middle of the night, the sweatiest you've ever been, and decide you need to shave your head or else you're gonna stop breathing. Hotcha, Bimo, how do I look? Like the devil. So, our bald baddies. Truthfully, I have wasted a whole lot of time and under any other circumstance, 100% of this video would have been about Heather. She's my favorite character and I love redemption arcs, but I'm not even sure that's what she goes through. It's more like a greater villain comes along so she joins the heroes to fight them, Ice King, Vegeta, and Team Rocket style. I won't delve too deep into Heather's psyche, but I will say that she cares a lot about her looks. She believes that they are all she's got. And we do find out later that she isn't even popular. She's just hot. In the first challenge of the show, she gets on Lashana's ass about being big, among other things I choose to forget. And then Harold says this to her in Drama 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 Island. I don't like being mean all the time. It's kind of become this habit of mine. Do you think that it's fun being the one that everyone hates? <laughs> Look at me! I don't even have any hair! <laughs> Maybe you're so afraid everyone will reject you that you push them away first. I'm guessing either your parents are divorced or you were really fat and pimply once. And she could be playing him because we know she's an expert in crocodile tears. She fake cries in Island to manipulate Trent and then fake cries to Alejandro to steal the win out from under him in World Tour and attempts to do it on Lightning in Revenge of the Island, but he's too dumb to care. Speaking of which, Lightning falls into the same group because despite not being bald, his hair is permanently changed white after he's struck by lightning. And I don't know a whole lot about electricity in the body, but I feel like this is gonna cause some complications later in life. Anyway, what Harold says actually cuts Heather deep. Can you tell that I did this myself? Like just now. And later we see in her video message from home that her parents aren't divorced. They're actually celebrating that she's gone. Unless they got divorced because of her and her leaving for the show revitalized their relationship and that spark. So they got undivorced all because she was gone, which is cartoonishly cruel even for this show. So let's assume she was fat in high school. This is actually a common theory I heard alongside the Izzy theory. I don't know if they were created by the theorizer or just like popularized by him, but check him out. He makes good stuff, mostly about penguins in Madagascar, which was my blind spot. I clearly didn't talk enough about this character in my review. <laughs> But the theory states in the phobia factor challenge, we never actually see Heather state what her fear is. And then later on in the challenge, we see that fear represented by a sumo wrestler. And she didn't conquer her fear. The only reason she gets a point is because she curled up into the fetal position into a ball and the sumo dude just tripped over her. I don't know why that counts. And what are sumo wrestlers? Fat. And then in the celebrity manhunt special, there's a controversy when Gwen points out her three ounce weight gain. And I know it's a parody of how the press actually covers uh, teenage drama in the real world, but this is what I'm talking about. 
Gwen was never like a super nice person. And it definitely did not help Heather. In the first challenge of the show, she refuses to get her hair wet. And then in the cooking challenge, we're coming back to that one a lot. A lot of people get injured. She gets the maddest she's gotten thus far because she burns off her eyebrows. Or rather, she explodes off her eyebrows. And then in her elimination, the episode where the final three contestants have to do dares made up by the previous failed contestants, she lands on Lindsay, whose dare is to have their head shaved by Chef because remember, in Phobia Factor, her greatest fear. Bad haircuts. Oh, okay, I change mine. That's so much scarier than a minefield. So then Heather does get a bad haircut and attempts to hide it with wigs for a long time after that. But in action, she starts to lose it a little bit as her obsession with hair makes her snap. And then when she leaves action after becoming friends with Lashana, she comments on her hair, but that's just kind of how their friendship works despite losing it. In World Tour, she finally starts to get her hair back, but is so used to people finding her repulsive now that she's caught off guard that Alejandro is attracted to her. A running joke in World Tour is how disgusting it is that Alejandro Alejandro may potentially find Heather attractive, despite in the first season, her most defining feature being that she can manipulate people by being hot and smart. She does it to Duncan, and he's notably one of the best players in the game. And it's something season one Heather would scoff at, like, of course he likes me, look at me. I lied about all the bald baddies being in the physical category because her hair does come back later and she's fine, but she is mentally irreparably damaged because of this. She has a reputation now because of total drama. All she needs is some friends. Everyone has an evil character they can excuse. Most people choose murderers. I choose Heather from Total Drama and the cast of Always Sunny. Speaking of Heather's friends, we know how much the loss of hair has affected her because every choice she makes to help people in World Tour is to further her goal of winning. Yeah, she defeats Alejandro and saves the day and helped out Cody and was nice to DJ, but in the end of the day, she won the money. She did all that to win the money. Likewise, Cody thinks that Heather is nice to him because she's just being nice, but she just wants to win the money. I don't think she actually cares that much about him. The only character that Heather is nice to in the entirety of World Tour that has nothing to do with furthering her role in the game is Sierra, specifically after she exploded and then lost all her hair. Sierra is already eliminated by this point. She has no in-game reason to help her. It's not building an alliance. She's out of the game. She helps her because she knows what it's like to be bald on international TV. That experience stuck with her. And if it made Heather nice, then it must be pretty powerful. Which is now gonna stick us with Sierra, and I know I put her in the bald group, mostly just to group them all together, but in reality it has very little effect on her, and she is shown as okay later, but they put a mentally unstable individual on a TV show that enables her behavior. Sierra is just like every other obsessive fangirl who believes her and Cody are meant to be together forever. But that was behind a computer. And then she gets to meet him in real life and it becomes a problem. Because I know statistically, I wanna see how much that bar goes down now that I've lost my hair. Some of you guys were obsessed fangirls writing fan fiction about One Direction kidnapping you. But what happened to you during your teenages? You grew up you grew out of it. Maybe you're still a fan of their work, but you're not as obsessed as you were when you were a preteen. But Sierra didn't get an opportunity to grow. So much so that when she meets a boy she's compatible with and likes hanging out with and gets along with in a later season, she can only contextualize her feelings through the lens of Cody. <laughs> I hate it here. She's only able to process affection through the lens of the Cody obsession. It's unhealthy is what it is. There is a world where Sierra eventually got over it and then had a normal geeky relationship with Cameron. Like they hit it off. But her perception of life and how it works has been warped by this show. And also, uh, she lost all her hair on the show. Psychology. Not only are some of our bald baddies split into categories, of physical and psychological, but they're also split into categories on whether they stayed bald or whether we saw them with hair later. Dave is one of the normal baddies who loses his hair the last time we see him and also uh, loses his mind. I'm surprised his hair even lasted this long considering how scared of germs he is. The heartbreak he suffered on the show and being pushed by Chris rendered him an evil, bald, maniacal maniac with a little taste for blood. Despite only seeing the season one time before doing this video, I knew this happened 
because people won't shut up about it. But I didn't remember how the season actually ended. And then I rewatched it for this video. If we're to assume that Beardo died while fighting the elements because he was launched somewhere near the island, then I got bad news for Dave fans. In the end, the finalists, Jasmine and Chris, all fly away from the island and leave Dave behind while the island is malfunctioning. Maybe they go back for him, maybe they don't, but maybe they go back for him and it takes them too long and it's too late for Dave. I'm just saying if you lined up all the Pocket Tail characters and asked me to pick two who would die in the wilderness, it would be Beardo and Dave. Before we talk about permanent disfigurements, let's talk about the final bald boy we see bounce back with hair, Alejandro. Do I even need to explain this one? He got burnt by a volcano and then was put in a stinky robot suit. And what is a surprising Revenge of the Sith reference? Because most of the time when you see a Star Wars reference in something, it's either, Ooh, I am your father, or I love you, I know. At least Fairly Odd Parents reference Jar Jar. The whole finale is a bunch of references put together, but we'll get to that in a second. But we do later see Alejandro get out of the suit where he's not burnt, not bald, and his legs are asleep for really like a day. So physically, he's okay. But he spent a year in that stinky robot suit. A year in which he did not have opposable thumbs and had no contact with anyone. Heather chastises him for not texting, but what about his family? Did they think he was dead? If that's the case, then Jose doesn't look too shaken up to see him unless he wanted him to die. As much as I would like to go in depth about Alejandro's inferiority complex due to his older brother, I just did. Pretty easy to explain, actually. I don't need a whole paragraph for that. I just told you. But he was put in what is technically a form of solitary confinement where he could not even speak. Despite being able to speak when he was first put in the robot, I guess Chris took that ability away. Evil man. And it messed with him. Like it would any human man. Now he can only sleep when he's all bundled up. Like me. But I think mine has more to do with brain stuff than it does being shoved in a giant robot for a year. Also, I said giant robot. It's actually, all things considered, not that big. Like big enough to hold a human? Barely. Alejandro may seem on top of his game in All Stars and ends off with a happy relationship with Heather. I Notice I didn't say healthy. But inside, underneath it all is a broken man. I just want to say real quick, I know people don't like All-Stars, but aside from Scortney, um, Alejandro eliminating Heather and getting revenge is like one of my favorite moments. It's really cool. But you know what isn't cool? Alejandro, mental issues. Why did I say it like that? Dakota and Stacy, their baldness actually has more in common than you think. Dakota went bald and then was mutated and cursed to a life of being a giant grammarless mutant monster, but we've covered this. Stacy doesn't just survive an explosion or get her head shaved. We see the hair fall out of her head after she holds a toxic waste riddled marshmallow. I really like Revenge of the Island because despite being short, every character serves an important purpose. They have their own role. Stacy's role is to teach people to not grab the toxic marshmallow anymore, ever, after this. I'm not a hair loss or radiation expert, but I'm pretty sure if all of your hair falls out at once, immediately, after holding something radiated that bad, best case scenario, you'll be bald forever. Worst case scenario, you are going to die. But I don't want to add Stacy to our already two character obituary, so let's stay on the safe side and say that she's just going to be bald for the rest of her life and have complications, probably. Here lies Princess Beautiful. She was so beautiful, but died of baldness? Which leads us to our final bald man, final character on this list, and the character I said I didn't want to talk about last time, and yet here we are, Ezekiel. The most requested camper for me to talk about, despite saying, that I would not do that. I guess it worked because here we are. I could go in depth into his home life, but like Alejandro, it's relatively simple. He lacks social skills because he was homeschooled and got bad advice from his folks. He tried to rectify this in drama, 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 drama by working with girls and agreeing not to be sexist anymore. And he tried to forge his own career during Celebrity Manhunt. Although he was a messed up kid, he had the potential to become someone. Total Drama World Tour. He was thrown out of a moving plane multiple times. He was toyed with by the host. He held on to the outside of the plane while it was flying, and that plane's already a death trap even inside. Lived in the cargo and slept in the landing gear. He lived with animals and ate rats and became more and more feral as the only people he could share his company with weren't people. They were animals and creatures. And maybe either way it has something to do with his homeschooling. Maybe a better man would have stayed sane. Maybe a lesser man would have died under these conditions. All we know is Ezekiel survived, but at what cost? He became 
feral. So feral that it began walking around on all fours and forgot every earthly desire beyond getting that briefcase with the million dollars. And that would be his downfall as he went Gollum style. See, I told you there'd be more references. As he finally gets the briefcase full of money, but sunk into the volcano. Now, lava works differently in total drama than it does in real life. It doesn't feel as though every inch of your skin is touching a hot stove. You fall for another second towards the lava, and now the air temperature has doubled to 410 degrees. At this point, any clothes you were wearing made of cotton would ignite into flames. Your hair would probably do the same. Uh, it's kind of more like Mario, where he jumps up and grabs his butt and goes, ooh, ow, ooh, ow! But it can damage you, like it damaged Alejandro for the time being. But Ezekiel's lucky because it shot him out of the volcano before he could sustain any damage any more damage. And at this point, Ezekiel has the capability to go home, get the proper help he needs and reacclimate to society. But he doesn't. We don't know how big of a gap of time between World Tour and Revenge of the Island there is, but based off Heather and Sierra's hair length, I'd say a little under over a year, just like it aired in real life. Ezekiel is on the boat with the rest of the kids Chris ruined and Eva. Ezekiel had the chance to become a real person again, but he was drawn back by the thing that turned him feral in the first place. The money. You would think that cutting my hair would mean I would be touching it less, but now I'm just going like this over and over. He wanted to win a season of Total Drama, and he believed, like the other campers, that he had another chance to do that. Till it was ripped away. By Chris. After the boat passes the island, like, oh, and he does manage to get back to the island, probably by swimming, but he ends up in an abandoned mine. The same mine that turned Dakota into a monster. If Ezekiel was just a feral human before, now he's crossed the point of no return and he's more monster than man. In All Stars, we see him again, but this time he spits acid. His exposure to toxic waste made him a Batman villain. Do I even need to explain this anymore? At the beginning, I kind of hyped up the both category like it would be popular. And there's a lot of characters here that could technically go in both, but really it's just for Ezekiel and the other two. So congratulations, Ezekiel, for being the contestant the most physically and psychologically fucked up. At least Dakota can talk. And that was how total drama ruined people. And now I'm free and I don't have to make another total drama video for another year, at least. I'm passing the torch. I don't want to be total drama guy anymore. I never wanted to be total drama guy. Switchy, Switchy's the total drama guy now. Not again. Quite frankly, I didn't know what this video was going to be for a long time. I spent a couple months writing the beginning of a character analysis before struggling and not deciding which character I wanted to talk about. And once I heard about the new season dropping, I knew I had to talk about one. That's a true story. In the middle of writing this, it just dropped randomly. And they would have been a part of this video if they didn't reboot the series, which to be fair, I should have expected. For anyone who wants to know my opinions, um, it takes a while to get good, but to be fair, a lot of Total Drama seasons take a while to get good. I'm saying like post-merger is when it's at its best. I like Wayne and Raj more than I thought I would. I thought that would be too gimmicky. And overall, I'm excited about the future. I want them to explore more stuff for these characters and I want them to do it somewhere that isn't an island. I mean, I knew when it was announced that I would be excited, new cast or not. It just got announced a while ago and then I happened to make a Total Drama video that blew up in the meantime. And from a writing sense, I'm finishing this video up way before before it comes out and I'm actually filming this again before it comes out because that's how videos work. So maybe a second season will be announced while I'm working on this before it goes up. I never thought I'd have to worry about a total drama video becoming dated, but here we are in the year 2023. What did you say? Oh, I mean, I don't know what year it is. Mm. What are you looking at? What? Oh yeah, I'm just wondering where we're gonna put this big cork board now. Like I've bought tons of McDonald's toys for a video before, but this is, actually no, the toys are way more crazy. That That's that's a lot. I may be ready to admit I have a problem. The total drama is alive and well, and I know this is probably gonna piss off half the people again. And now, finally, I never have to talk about that goddamn baby show for babies. No. No, 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 no. What the hell? Wake up, slacker boy. What's going on? <laughs> what? He's so funny. You have no idea what you're in for. <laughs> Thank you.